<clears throat> Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing very well. Um, so let's get straight into it. Any of you guys that are on the call, uh, just dump a message in and I'll be happy to get to it. There's a couple of messages over on the Taro platform, which I'll get to in just a moment. So the schedule for today, I think it will be rude not to talk about um, Silicon Valley Bank. I know it's a top, top, uh, you know, a pretty hot topic as of right now, but there's broader consequences, and I think there's a lot of misinformation surrounding the bigger contagion risks and what that ultimately impacts for credit growth. So we'll talk about what ultimately happened to Silicon Valley Bank, why it's it, Silicon Valley Bank is just the weakest domino. Uh, it's just the first one that fell, and sure, it was on mismatches of duration, but at the end of the day, everything in the world is has an unrealized loss. And there's a lot of mismatch in terms of duration, such as pension funds, right? So if you look at baby boomers, on average, all of them will be 61 years of age in 2025. And their pensions are going to be built between equity and bonds, and bonds are down 30%, right? So there's going to be a mismatch, and there's going to be a sort of unrealized loss on those pensions as well. And are they held to maturity in order to get par value back? That's what the problem is. Silicon Valley Bank probably could have and should have failed because of underwriting terrible businesses, taking equity as collateral, and that equity is probably worthless. But it should not have failed because they held US treasuries and there was a sort of mishap in terms of the rate of change, in terms of rate hikes, the messaging and rhetoric of the central bank, and how that impacts the business. But look, it's not Silicon Valley. It's not just Silicon Valley Bank. It's pretty much all sort of um, regional banks. And we'll talk about that because there's an awful lot to do with obviously regulation as well. Top three banks, unfortunately, we're going to have a big issue with competition. Why? Because the regulation means that the unrealized losses are accounted for in the liquidity ratios for Citigroup for argument's sake. So they're already well capitalized. Where did that cash come from? Will they stop doing buybacks? And so they were able to raise an awful lot more cash the tier one capital that they have is correct, whereas smaller regional banks, tier one capital was factoring in none of the unrealized losses. So they weren't capitalized properly for run on the bank, essentially. So we'll start off with that in just a moment. Then we're going to talk about two new holdings, which is really what I wanted to talk about. Lumentum and Haynes Brands. Um, Haynes Brands, very, 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 very straightforward investment. Uh, Management made a big mistake. CFO's on his way out the door. The market has dis discounted the assets significantly at a point where my view was that interest rates would roll over. Little did I know the two-year bond yield, government bond yield, would price 1% out in terms of rate hike expectations in the click of a finger. Uh, three days it took. So refinancing, interest expense comes down. The average interest expense for the company is drum roll please, 7.92%, it's pretty damn high. So just refinancing and bringing the durations to pay down that debt further out, and at the same time getting that interest rate down uh, is gonna do wonders for the business. So we're gonna have a look at that as well. And Lumentum, I uh, built out a pretty decent position recently. It's actually the largest position in the portfolio, and it's kind of a, an, an exciting business. Uh, a lot of concern about their consumer-focused business. Uh, the consumer facing business, but it's a very small segment of the revenue and the impact on the share price, I think, was a little bit uh, overdone. So we'll talk about Lamentum as well. Anyway, let's start off with Silicon Valley Bank, uh, broader consequences. Uh, we'll talk about credit growth, et cetera, in just a moment. But I think it's really important to really understand what actually happened. Um, so US 02Y, we went to the daily. As you can see here over the past three days, one, two, three, we've gone from 5.1%. We're currently at about 4.12%. So we've literally dropped 1% in interest rates in three days. Talk about liquid markets. So I just want to go over some of the narratives around this is shockingly poor. Um, last year, my view was, and I've done this on a live stream, and I've said a number of times that Powell and Co., I hope it's just rhetoric talking tough because if they keep raising interest rates, there's going to be significant damage. And, and there's going to be significant damage for this reason right here. So you can't pump $5 trillion into the market in a 0% interest rate environment where that gets put to work at 0%, give forward guidance and say no rate hikes until 2024, and we're not thinking about thinking about raising rates in 2001, and then go ahead and raise to 4% by the end of 2022. And the reason being is $5 trillion of assets were invested when the cost of capital goes to zero, the return on assets goes to zero, so $5 trillion gets invested, 
at the peak valuation on 0% interest rates, and then the Fed just turns their back and starts raising interest rates. What ends up happening? We start crashing in terms of asset price values. Now, there's nothing wrong with 0% interest uh, market environment. Yes, when the cost of capital goes to zero, the return on assets go to zero. There's no real sort of opportunity to see massive multiple expansion. You've got to work a little bit harder. You've got to find companies that have stable cash flows, right? So cash flows are very important. And who's the natural buyer to stock? Well, if the company is doing buybacks, the earnings per share is growing, not because you have organic growth or uh, M&A, but because you're reducing the number of shares. And so you can still make good money in that market. You just got to work a little bit harder. But the rhetoric from the central bank was absolutely shocking. It was completely irresponsible to say in 2021, no rate hikes before 2024, when inflation was already at 5%. It was completely reckless to say that inflation was transitory, again, when inflation was 5%. And it was reckless to say, we're not thinking about thinking about raising rates. And this is all in 2021. 2022 comes around and they raise at the fastest pace in history. What ends up happening is investments go into longer duration assets where they get tied up and then they get absolutely crushed. Right. And so in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, this here is an example, right? And this is essentially what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. And both of these are tied together. And we'll talk about it in just a moment. Just imagine a bank that has $100 billion in deposits. The executives now in Silicon Valley Bank, they were completely reckless because they put way too high. I think it was something like nine, over 90% of um Deposits were put into 10-year bond yields, meaning the par value would only return itself after 10 years. The duration was way too long. And so Silicon Valley Bank was a very special and silly case, but it doesn't matter because it would have happened across the board if deposits start rolling out. And I'll explain why that would have happened anyway in just a moment. So you have $100 billion in deposits. Let's assume that this bank has $90 billion in 10-year bonds yielding 2%. Why would they do that? Well, if the executives at the bank, which ultimately are getting compensation based on performance and earnings power, are incentivized to go further out the risk curve because the central bank are saying, listen, interest rates on the short end are going to be zero till 2024, they got to get more yield. So they got to go further out the risk curve and they got to buy longer duration assets. That's what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. Now, this is where the problem is. When you raise rates at such a fast pace, you got a situation where you yield 2% on your 10-year bonds, but the overnight rate is 4%. In fact, as of right now, it's 4.5 to 4.75%. So what happens to your deposits? Your deposits start draining out, and those deposits start moving into a different institution. So look at Charles Schwab. Charles Schwab has $113 billion in held to maturity assets, yielding 1.5%, down massively. At the same time, the average duration in interactive brokers is 42 days. So interactive brokers are yielding 4% on cash balances, Schwab 1.5%. What do you think is going to happen? If you don't want to invest anything and you want to make that yield on your cash balance, you're going to take your money out of Schwab and you're going to put it over to interactive brokers, just as an example. And so when you're looking at this scenario, there was 15% of deposits that were sucked out of Silicon Valley Bank in a 24-hour period. It's about 43 billion in 24 hours. So in this case, it'd be the equivalent to 15 billion. But you don't have 15 billion. You only have 10. 90 billion is tied in for 10 years. And so what you need to do is you need to sell these bonds. But here's the problem. The bonds are down 20%. So the mark to market value of those bonds is actually 72 billion. So here's a company that's sitting on $18 billion worth of losses because the mark to market value of the bonds are down 20%. And if you need to raise money for these redemptions, you have to realize this loss and then you're screwed. And so part of the problem was forward rhetoric, completely reckless and raising interest rates at the fastest, race in hi fastest rate in history after injecting $5 trillion into the economy. My whole point was things are not good because of the debt that we added to the system in 2020 and 2021. M2 money in the US grew 44% in two years. It was absolutely incredible. Debt to GDP goes from 80% to 125%. Just absolutely bizarre numbers. And what that does is it creates systemic risk if you raise interest rates too high. The idea of higher for longer. The idea that the Federal Reserve don't care about whether the government could actually finance their interest expense. It's, it's just all nonsense. Eventually, something was going to break. And as of right now, it did break. Here's the thing. It doesn't matter 
it doesn't matter if it was a case of Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank was just the very weakest of the bunch, and it was the one that went down first. And the ironic thing is they went down for holding U.S. treasuries, where the par value, if they just held that for the 10 years, they get the 90 billion back. So the ironic thing is they went down because there was obviously a little bit of fear. Capital exits the market. They don't have, they have a massive shortfall, and the bank essentially has no cash. If they're 1% short, the bank is a zero because 100% of people don't want to be stuck in that 1% that has no cash. And so it causes this big, massive rush, fear, shares go down massively. But it doesn't matter. For the example I mentioned a moment ago, you have Charles Schwab. If I have an account open with Charles Schwab and they offer me 1.5% and then I don't want to invest for the next year, I think this is uncertainty. I want to ultimately raise some money on my cash balance. And interactive brokers have a lower maturity, 42 days on average. I want to take my money out because I don't want 1.5%. I want 4% to maximize my returns. And so you take your money out and you pop it over, your deposits go down, and all of a sudden, what's the problem? Your health maturity has to start realizing some losses. Equity starts to go down pretty quickly. And it causes a chain reaction. Now, here's the problem. Here's the biggest problem. All of these regional banks... If you go back, um, the Dodd Frank, there was changes made to Dodd Frank. I think it was in 2017, 2018. There was a lot of lobbying, and funnily enough, it was Sil uh, Silicon Valley Bank CEO that was head of the lobby group. I think he was head of the lobby group. He was part of it anyway. Um, they were lobbying so that they didn't have to disclose what their liquidity ratios are. So Dodd Frank changed, and anyone that had assets below 250 billion didn't have to disclose what their assets, what their liquidities uh, essentially were. You end up in a situation where they're disclosing, yeah, look, we have 14% in tier one capital, whatever it may be, but they're not disclosing what the unrealized losses are on the portfolio. So that 14% or whatever that they disclose, it may not be a fair reflection of the bank's liquidity. And that's what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. Whereas if you look at a bank like Citigroup, JP Morgan, Bank of America, they have to disclose and raise cash factoring in the unrealized losses. So look at Citigroup, we own Citigroup. Citigroup, what they need to do is they need to raise some cash. How did they raise cash? Well, they stopped paying, they stopped doing buybacks to raise cash to offset the unrealized losses. Every 1% move in the Fed funds rate, it will impact the bank by about a billion dollars in unrealized losses. Not really a big deal to Citigroup. It's a company that's trading at six times earnings. It's a company that has over 250 billion in cash in the bank. They'll be fine because it's way over-regulated. So here's the systemic risk factor. Regional banks are worthless. There's a massive regulatory failure. You start to see deposits withdraw out of all regional banks, and it goes into major banks that are have over $250 billion in um, assets because they're fairly reflecting their liquidity position. And so you have massive concentration. I think it's a pretty good deal for Bank of America, JP Morgan, and Citigroup. So there's a big problem for regional banks. And how does that impact credit growth, of course? Well, if regional banks slow down, you've got a lot of small businesses that do uh, transactions with regional banks in the very near term. Is there going to be a challenge there? Probably, unless the Fed step in. And this is entirely the Fed's fault. I know there's a lot of people out there that said, yeah, banks, don't worry about it. Banks, what they normally do is they hedge via interest rate swaps. Don't worry about it. It's Silicon Valley and it's only Silicon Valley. Yeah. Fine, whatever. Here's the problem. Everyone's underweight. Everyone has massive unrealized losses because you pumped $5 trillion into the system at 0% interest rate, and then you raised rates at the fastest uh, pace in history. And the problem is pensions can't hold cash. They need to get 8% annual return. They have to put it to work. When interest rates are zero, they have to go further out the risk curve. Does that mean holding longer duration assets? Possibly. Does it mean the Toronto pension fund has to go out and buy FTX? Small position, tiny position, but does it mean that they have to go out and buy FTX? Well, they need to get some, they need to go further out the risk curve in order to generate that 8% when the return on assets is zero. And that's ultimately what had been happening. So here's the problem. Everybody let's assume they all have interest rate swaps. What happened in the global financial crisis when people had credit default swaps on banks? Some people didn't even get paid out because when the credit default swaps goes up 100X, the counter, there's counterparty risk. The underwriter of those credit default swaps are bankrupt. They're bankrupt as well. 
And so if the whole system has massive unrealized losses because the Fed raised, first of all, injected far too much and then raised way too quick, way too, uh, way too high, like everyone has unrealized losses and you end up on massive counterparty risk. So it doesn't matter if they hedged. Go back to the global financial crisis. Some players didn't even get paid out in their credit default swaps despite getting the directional bias correct because all banks went under. So there's counterparty risk as well. So it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense that this is an iso- This is not iso- It's not isolated. You can see it already. <laughs> you can see it already. It started off with, um, is it Signature Bank and Silicon Valley Bank? Both of those were backstopped. Now you're seeing First First Republic Bank down 65% or whatever today. You're seeing banks across the board, even companies like reasonably solid companies like Ali Financial down pretty damn hard today. Um, all of them are down massively. Regional banks are in a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. It's going to be a lot of concentration risk. And it's the Fed's fault. It's 100% the Fed's fault. It's the Fed's fault because there was too much liquidity injected, which needs time. Rate of change matters. You need time for assets to adjust. You can't raise interest rates to 4% 12 months after, even more so after your forward guidance and your rhetoric was inflation is transitory. We're not raising rates. We're not even thinking about raising rates. So the forward guidance, shocking. And at the same time, the reaction to fight inflation, completely disconnected. We know it's disconnected because last week he was in front of the Senate. Not once did he mention the the banks at all. In fact, the minute that they ended, there's a banking crisis. Regional banks are in a big, massive issue. And here's the problem. Here's the problem. It's U.S. Treasuries. It's unreal losses on U.S. Treasuries. And the problem is, like, you look at pensions as an example. It's not concentrated just to U.S. Treasuries and regional banks. It can spread massively unless it's nipped in the butt right now. And it can spread massively because I have a mortgage, 30 years, 1.2% fixed. The floating rate right now is over 4%. The bank that underwrote that mortgage for me is way underwater on that mortgage. So mortgages in the United States are massively underwater if they have to mark to market it, if they have to mark those assets to market. So you have like traditional loans that are massively underwater because 98% of mortgages in the US are fixed rate at an average of 3.3%. Well, the floating rate's over 7%. So everything is underwater, absolutely everything. If you look at pensions, Baby boomers are set to retire. On average, the retirement age in the U.S. is 61 years of age. 1946 to 1964. Take your 1964, which is the last year baby boomers were born, at 61 years of age. The last baby boomers will be retiring in 2025. It's probably a 60-40 split. Equities to bonds. Your bonds are down 30%. Your retirement is a lot smaller this year versus what it was 18 years ago. So liabilities just exploded higher. So that's essentially what's been happening and it's happening because, yeah, inflation is not the problem. Inflation is the solution. You inject way too much liquidity into the system to the point where you can't actually finance that debt. So you have to give it time. You need time for assets to reset. I thought last year we were going to see a sort of gradual interest rate hike. It didn't happen. It went way above what I thought. Now look at the curve. Like just last week, not even a week ago, five days ago, Jerome Powell was saying, we're going to get to 6%. We're going to maybe raise 50 basis points. Here's the market this morning. The market, not a chance. 25 basis points, 25 basis points, and then we're cutting July, September, November, December, another one in March of next year, another one in May of next year, June, July. We're starting to cut. That's what the market's pricing in. Way too far, broke something. This is not 1970s or 1980s. That analog is dead. It's it's dead on arrival. And the interesting thing is when we have a look at the data, so if you have a look at CPI, if you actually are, care about like your assets and you care about inflation, you care about ultimately the directional bias of, of your portfolio longer term, you should really want to know what's going on with CPI. CPI reported 6.4%. Here's the problem with CPI. They have what's known as hedonic pricing or hedonic substitution. So let's say chicken prices go up 10% and turkey prices go up 2%. They'll substitute because they're both white meat, right? They'll substitute the higher price for the lower price. So what's known as hedonic substitution. 
So that's something that they do. They just change the weightings and the way in which they reported. If you look at shelter, for argument's sake, it's about 15 months out of date. They only collect the, the data on, on rental yields twice a year. It's like 15 months out of date. And what happened over the past 12 months, remember that core CPI, like 40% of that is shelter. So what happened over the past 12 months, the Federal Reserve has been making decisions on the next 12 months. So truflation has really become the standard for an awful lot of people. I'm seeing more and more people use it. Truflation has taken 10 million data points, 10 million data points. And they're across over 30 different data providers. And they're using alternative data. So like Zillow, uh, Redfin, et cetera, they would give you insight into where rental market is in real time, as opposed to... Um, yeah, as opposed to the traditional way which CPI are doing it, collecting the data every six months. So this is all in real time. So this here is, if we have a look at overall, we're at, this is on an annualized rate, we're at 4.56%. Uh, Here's the interesting thing. Back in May, June, and July, when CPI hit its peak at 9.1%, Truflation was suggesting that it's a lot higher at 11.96%. Why? What's what's the discrepancy? Obviously, better data. It's over 10 million data points. But at the same time, it comes back to that hedonic substitution. So where we are in terms of inflation, you're hiking into a disinflationary environment. Wages are the structural inflationary component, but at the margin, commodities are going to impact it. So look at crude oil, gasoline, look at soft commodities, all of these copper all of these input raw materials are all down. And on a year over year basis, which inflation is measured at the margin, headline will be hit. But core, because we have 3.6% unemployment, just out of 311,000 jobs, labor market still reasonably strong. At the uh, ultimately, from a secular or from a um, more, yeah, it's, it's more of a secular a trend change. Wages are a lot stronger. So you got these two different dynamics competing with each other. So headline is coming down massively, largely driven by commodities and the slowdown there. But you still have pretty stubbornly high wage growth. Over time, you're going to see big fluctuations, but the average inflation rate is going to be higher. I would say it's probably going to average over 5% for the decade. That doesn't mean we can't go below 5%. It doesn't mean that we can't get back up to 9.1% either. It's going to it's going to be quite volatile. But as I pointed out on this chart here, we're beginning to see the limitations of monetary policy. We're in a 1940s type environment, not a 1980s type environment. And the reason being is debt to GDP. So interest rates, you know, we got up to 4.5 to 4.75 and things start to break. We can't go higher than there. It doesn't matter how high inflation is. It's not an inflation story. And it's interesting that now that people realize that the bank deposits are at risk, nobody cares about inflation anymore. Inflation's not really the devil Inflation is actually the solution. So this is the 1940s. That orange line is CPI inflation. Got as high as 20%. Spiked as high as 20%. It also went negative. Again, at the margin, you'll see commodities. But broadly speaking, over that decade, you had very high inflation. Back in the 1980s, you had very low debt. As a percentage of GDP, it was, not, it was below 40%. But back in the 1940s, during this period, we were up around 120% where we currently are. And if you look at tax receipts... Back in the 1970s and 80s, when we had Paul Volcker, he had a lot of weapons. Look at that there. You have tax receipts as a percentage of total debt as high as 41%. You had tons of room to fight inflation with monetary policy. You don't have that today because you only have, now this chart probably needs to be updated. It's 2021 or 2022's data. I'm not sure. But um, you only have about 10, 11% uh, tax receipts as a percentage of the total debt. It's probably higher right now. The CBO um, is essentially forecasting a $1.4 trillion, I have it actually here, $1.4 trillion deficit. I took the screen capture. This is hilarious. Interest expense, net interest expense, they guided in 2023, $640 billion. We ended last year at $852 billion. Can't go that high. And even with 200, 200, or, uh, yeah, $212 billion less than where we currently are, you're still looking at a deficit of $1.4 trillion. A deficit is spending more money than you're bringing in. So that's more debt. So your debt's going to increase another $1.4 billion. But all of this data is already sort of, it's, it's already for the, for the bin. It's all wrong. And it's all wrong because rate of change, rate of change. You can't, you cannot pump that amount of liquidity and sort of debt into the system and then raise rates at the pace that the Fed did without breaking something. 
And that's part of the fundamental thesis. It's not that economic conditions are so strong. It's that inflation will be above interest rates throughout the decade. And then the question becomes, do you want to hold cash at lower than inflation rate interest? Probably not. Probably not. And that that's ultimately what our fundamental thesis was. I just didn't expect us to get this far. It just doesn't make any sense. And this is 100% the fault of the Federal Reserve. This is, and it's not isolated to just Silicon Valley Bank. It's like we can go down that rabbit hole and everything has unrealized losses. If you have to start realizing those losses, it's a slippery slope on the downside. It's a really, really, really slippery slope. So that's ultimately where we are with regards to Silicon Valley Bank. It's not really about Silicon Valley Bank. It's about, it's, it's much broader than that. And it really comes down to how FDIC, Federal Reserve, a treasury department all come together and try and sort of build a little bit more confidence back into the banking sector. Cause as of right now, like how's KORE doing like regional banks? Yeah. I mean, this isn't, this is in free fall. Imagine, imagine, you know, what is it? Apparently it's up 11% today. It's not, it's, it's down since what is it down? It's down 11 and a half percent on the day regional banking index in the United States. And the irony of all of this is, I bought Bitcoin in 2018 and I bought Bitcoin in 2019, late 2018, 2019, after reading up on the bail-in system in Europe and, and how like in Cyprus, people lost all of their deposits. And I was like, well, where could I put my money if it's a bail-in system in Europe? And I thought, well, you, well, Bitcoin, if I don't need the capital for the next 10 years, well, I'll put it into Bitcoin. And the reason being is supply is already, we already know what supply is. Uh, we already know how many blocks are going to be mined. We already know all of that. Governments can't come in and essentially dilute it. Right? So if you look at the US dollar, the dollar could get diluted. And if you save in dollars and over time, inflation is growing at a higher pace than your savings rate, you lose money. So where do you put it? You have to put it into something that's sort of deflationary, such as Bitcoin, just as an example, maybe gold as well, something like that. And I bought this in 2018, 2019, at the time we had in Europe, we had a situation where negative yielding bonds, banks couldn't pass on those negative yields. So they were just stomach, stomaching the losses. And I was thinking, this is a recipe for disaster. I'd want to own some Bitcoin. If I'm right, we go from a 50 billion market cap up to a trillion dollars. And that's a 20x return. If I'm wrong, well, so be it. At the margin, you know, it's not going to massively crush me. And the irony is I was thinking it was going to be Europe. And it's a U.S. bank where people are concerned about whether the deposits are going to be made whole or not, or whether the deposits are going to be bailed in. It's absolutely insane that this is being driven by monetary policy. And so Bitcoin over the past couple of days has been screaming higher. And yeah, I just think it's very ironic that um, it was a U.S. bank and not a European bank, despite all of, and, and maybe Europe is going to end up in the same situation as well. It's just delayed a little bit because I know they want to keep raising interest rates, but it doesn't. It's not really a good omen after the amount of debt that's been pumped into the system. But anyway, as of right now, what we're probably likely to see is, you know, liquidity uh, barometers such as Bitcoin, uh, gold, that sort of stuff is already saying, look, we're going to get a pivot. There's going to be a lot of industries and sectors that are going to wait until we get confirmation from the Federal Reserve. As of right now, in the past three days, we've pretty much got to a point where there's 25 basis points priced in. And then it's just cuts all the way into 2024. Uh, that's what's priced into the curve as of right now. And rates are just absolutely plummeting. So we've got a situation where you've got 3.6% unemployment. Again, there is a big mega risk here. What's credit growth likely to be if regional banks slow down? But we have a big mega sort of issue here. We don't know what credit growth would be and how that might impact the economy, but it's something we should keep an eye on. But if we if the Federal Reserve can clean this up, if the FDIC and ultimately they were phenomenal during the global financial crisis, but if they can help clear it up and the Treasury Department can help clear it up, you have a situation where you have a reasonably strong economic backdrop. Growth is slowing down, absolutely, but rates have come off massively, massively. And if you do get some sort of pivot, which the market is ultimately pricing in here, calling total BS on the uh, Federal Reserve, and I'll talk about Powell in a moment because Powell is going to go down. I'm almost certain he's going to go down as the worst Federal Reserve president we've ever seen. But um, if we do start to see a reversal, you got to go back to 1994, 1995, 
we had a situation where you had an activist fed and they started cutting mid cycle and it extended the cycle on. So we have been in a period where you cut interest rates and like, I just got a comment earlier on. It's, it's really lazy. It's like, Oh, inflation is exactly the same as the seventies and eighties. No, it's not. There's many different variables that go into it. It's like the forties because of the debt levels. It's not like the seventies and eighties. We can't repeat the seventies and eighties. If we repeat the seventies and eighties, the fed doesn't exist because 98% of their balance sheet is U S government bonds and mortgage backed securities that are insured by the U S government. And if they default, well, what's the point of the federal reserve? Their entire balance sheet is defaulted and <laughs> they're out of business. And so I, I do think we're like ultimately what the market's pricing in is, is, is the easier conditions. Bitcoin up eight and a half percent today, four or five percent yesterday. I think this is obviously sniffing out easier liquidity conditions, which is like I, I didn't expect that Bitcoin would get to as low as it did. But I also didn't expect, you know, the central bank to get as hawkish as they did. And this is ultimately why uh, if we have a look at this here. So John Maynard Keynes was half right. John Maynard Keynes' view was, look, when we go into a recession and we start to slow down, you know, government should start optimizing fiscal policy in order to get aggregate demand higher. And as aggregate demand starts to increase due to fiscal policy, you scale back when demand comes back to the market. Keynes was 100% right on that. But Frederick Hayek, who was his competitor at the time, we went with Keynes' model. Frederick Hayek was also half right. He was more of a capitalist, you know, free market type thinker where inflation will solve for itself. If we have a problem where egg prices are screaming higher, well, the incentive caused bias would be, you know, lay more chickens, get more eggs, flood the market with supply and price comes down in an opportunistic way. So Hayek's, Hayek's work is as important, um, Frederick Hayek's work is as important, if not more important, than John Maynard Keynes' work, because everyone understands Keynesian economics, which again was half right, not entirely right, but half right. And Hayek was also half right. And this is a paper, and this is what really bugs the hell out of me about this, but this is a paper, Inflation, Unemployment, and Hayek. And it's from 1975, May 1975. And it's talking about Hayek's policy when it comes to inflation. And the irony is this is in the archives of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. So I, look, I've spent a lot of time reading about inflation. I, I didn't come to the conclusions that I have on inflation just by licking my finger and testing where the wind is going, like a lot of people seem to be doing today. I did try and figure out where we were and where we're potentially going. And it's really interesting because if we go down here to consequences, this segment here, I actually just put... I did post it as a just a chart here earlier, just in case I couldn't find it. But if we go down here to consequences, there's a number of different consequences to higher inflation. But this here is crucially important. This is crucially important. So what's Jerome Powell saying? I think everybody understands what Powell's saying. And it's just nonsense. He's saying we need to get the unemployment rate up to 4.6% so that we can get inflation down. And that's what's known as the Phillips curve. It suggests that ultimately the unemployment rate and inflation have an inverse relationship. So Jerome Powell is focused on the Phillips curve, which is dead wrong in this market environment. And we already have evidence from Hayek's work. And this is in the Federal Reserve's archives, or archives from almost 50 years ago. So we already have a point of reference. Powell's licking his finger. He's checking which way the wind is going. And he likes the idea that he could be someone like Paul Volcker, but he can't. He can't. And so this segment here is really important. Over an extended period, the unemployment rate accompanying sustained inflation is no, uh, is no lower than in the absence of sustained inflation. In Hayek's work, the reasonable goal of a high and stable level of employment can probably be secured as well as we know, as, as well as we know how while aiming at the stability of some uh, comprehensive price level this is really important. Inflation may initially contribute to a lowering of the unemployment rate. So inflation went up, spending went up. And there's another really important point in this, which I'm going to go over in a second. But the unemployment rate came down. Initially, this is in 1975. Initially, the unemployment rate can come down due to the inflationary pressures. But after inflationary ex expectations catch up with reality, this is no longer the case. In other words, this means that the Phillips curve does not exist. Jerome Powell is setting monetary policy based on the Phillips curve. Based on the Phillips curve. This idea that let's get the unemployment rate up to 4.6%. What's another problem with that? 56% of the income for the U.S. government is what? Tax income. 
It's income tax on individual salaries. And what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is they're already forecasting a deficit every single year into 2033. This is the Congressional Budget Office. They do this every year. They're suggesting that they're going to hit a deficit every single year, factoring in individual income taxes as ultimately 56% of total income. 2.6 trillion, 4.8 trillion. Well, I'll pull it up what they were anticipating this year, but the average over 75 years, it works out to be that. 2632 divided by 4896, 53.7%. Sorry, it's still a pretty significant amount. 50, 53.75% is individual income tax. So yeah, why not? We're already going to spend way more on entitlements, et cetera. Why not get the unemployment rate up? Why not get more people out of the labor market? And let's get that individual tax rate down so as we can bump up that deficit. It's just total nonsense. But the fact of the matter that this here is in the Federal Reserve's archives really bugs the hell out of me because, you know, if Powell was more like Bernanke in the sense that he was a, a student of history, maybe we wouldn't be in this mess that we're in right now today. Here's the other part of this article that's very important. Debt levels continue to increase, and they're likely to continue increasing because the household are actually in pretty decent shape. And they're in pretty decent shape because, you know, 98% of mortgages are fixed rate at 3.3%, and there's 65% um, home ownership rate in the U.S. So you got 3.3% fixed rate interest, always fixing your liabilities, and you got a variable income that's growing in excess of 6% per year. Very positive for the household. What have they been doing? Increasing revolving credit. So inflation encourages debt. So during the period 15 years prior to this, in so 1960, so if we have a look at that chart, if we have a look at this chart around 1960, which is when this is taken from, so around 1960, which as we're coming down here, debt levels are still pretty elevated, but in and around there all the way down, what we ended up seeing was inflation encouraged debt. So we seen a scenario where private debt increased 300% over the past 15 years and public debt about doubled over that period. So debt actually increases in higher in inflationary environments, which is a really interesting dynamic as interest rates are increasing, but there you go. And that's ultimately been happening as well. So as of right now, this is a mega boo-boo for the Federal Reserve. And I think if you had any doubts whether the Federal Reserve knew what they were doing, I think now obviously solidifies that they're really just winging it. The fact that they, it didn't come up in Congress a day before we had a bank run, and that was mentioned by a really good bank analyst that I follow, actually, if anyone's on Twitter, I definitely recommend checking them out. But Richard Whelan was talking about how regional banks would be in a, a spot of bother back in November of last year. So client note, given that Powell said nothing about banks during the two days of testimony and nobody asked him about banks, it's pretty good. It's a pretty good bet that the Fed and the Treasury were caught flat footed on Silicon Valley Bank. They didn't even anticipate these risks, which is kind of surprising because when you do inject $5 trillion at 0% and then raise to over 4%, like there is going to be well, obviously, the lags are going to have pretty significant impact. So that's that's ultimately what Silicon Valley Bank, um, right now, it's really going to depend on how they're going to respond and mop up this mess. My bet would be, same as always, QE6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, yeah, it'll be like a broken record. It'll be exactly the same. And then the question is, if you have interest rates lower than inflation and nobody really cares about inflation anymore because we know that there's a big bigger problem with maybe deposits or something like that. Um, where do you put your money, right? So what do you think on last Thursday when all this broke and a lot of companies believed that they didn't have access to their funds, the average account had 4.2 million. What would you prefer, to, like in hindsight, if you had a predict, pr predicted that, what would you have done with the capital? F put it somewhere else, I'm not sure. But you definitely wouldn't have left it in the banking sector. It probably would have went into productive assets. So I think a lot like there's five trillion dollars in money market funds. I think that a lot of that could go to work, um, and that'll obviously be very beneficial towards risk assets. Not all assets are valuable. Like you look at something like Nvidia, it's gone X growth, it's a hundred times price to earnings, and they just issued a, a shelf offering of ten billion dollars. So they're going to dilute by about two percent of market cap. They're not growing, and they're hundred times PE. It's not really a company I'd want to own. Right? So there is a lot of very expensive businesses like that that are out there. But there's also a lot of very cheap businesses like something like Lumentum, 
where most of the revenue doesn't come from consumer facing businesses. It actually comes from more uh, industrial B2B type businesses, such as, you know, charter communications, increasing their capital expenditure. Um, telecom and datacom accounts for 75% of the revenue today, and it's grown like a weed, which we'll get into in just a moment. But just to wrap up here, this is sort of the market environment I was anticipating midway through last year, early last year. I didn't anticipate that we get to where we currently are, clearly. But now things are starting to break. And unfortunately, I think it's going to cost probably a couple of trillion more to fix it than just slowing down the rate of uh, the, the interest rate pace. You know, if we slow down the interest rate pace, sure, inflation is not going to be the end of the world. Um, the contribution is going to be anyone that spends money is going to pay incrementally higher tax. And that's, you know, it is what it is. But now we're in a situation where it's going to be trillions, in my view, to try and clean this up. So that, that's where we are. Next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll have a better idea. But, you know, my bet would be Fed will come in pretty soon and start mopping it up with ridiculous amounts of liquidity. And you can see already that the market is, is calling total bullshit. In this scenario with regional banks breaking, if the Federal Reserve tried to go against the market, it, it would just be game over. It's just not, it wouldn't happen. It really wouldn't happen. Um, it really wouldn't happen. So that's that. Uh, next, let's talk about, we'll start off with Lumentum. Really interesting because I started to look at Lumentum and then this tweet came out. I started a small position in Lumentum. But actually, before I go into this, I think there's a couple of questions here. Greetings, Ronnie. Hi, Tom. Um, seems like the hardest thing with investing in banks is to find out what their asset portfolio actually is. Uh, yeah, with those, well, there is ways of finding out, eh? Um, like, look at Charles Schwab. They announced that there was um, $113 billion in held to maturity assets at 1.5% interest. So they bought bonds. They bought bonds way before we are right now. Like if, if the overnight rate's at, you know, 4 or 5%, there is ways. If you go through their earnings report, you can find it. You, you really can. But yeah, you might need a trained eye for sure. But um, you could probably put two and two together by going through their, their reports. Um, okay, uh, Lumentum. Apple contract for VC, SELs. Is a, essentially, they had 50% market share. It's expected to go down to 30 to 40%. So they're going to lose a bit of market share on the iPhone 15, specifically for VC, SELs. So it's important to understand the revenue mix and then what we pay for the company and then the potential growth moving forward. It's a really interesting company. I, I personally really like it. So let me just pull up some of my notes. Um, where's Lamentum? Um, that's Lamentum. Oh, sorry, it's not in here. It's in Sheets. So yeah, let's pull up. Yeah, here it is here. All right. So let's pull up the revenue. Uh, let me see. If I zoom in a little bit further. Make that a little bit smaller. Or make that a little bit smaller. Yeah, there we go. That should that should do it. All right. So the revenue breaks down into three different categories for Lumentum. And it breaks down into telecom and datacom, consumer and industrial. And then you have lasers. So that's total opcoms, both of those. And then you have lasers. So total opcoms is as of December on the uh, 10K filing, it was $448 million for opcoms. And then to a smaller extent, you have lasers, 57.2 million. So when we look at the market share that they're losing, it's in VCSELs, which VCSELs is segmented in consumer and industrial. So if you go back to October 2021, there was $190 million per quarter being generated, which accounted for a consumer and industrial 42.3% of the revenue. So you had 42% coming from consumer and industrial, 48.2% coming from telecom and datacom. And that broke down as $216 million for telecom datacom, $190 million for consumer and industrial. Well, in December 2021, they lost 31%. In March 2022, they lost 22%. In June, they lost 11.8%. In October, a bit of a bump, 5%. In December, 30%. Why? Slow down on smartphone sales. That segment has been decimated. It's gone from 190 million down to 64.6 million. While all this was happening, the top line was actually growing. Not a huge amount, but it was growing. And so too was margins. 
But the main takeaway is from December, the revenue coming from that segment was only 64.6 million, which only accounts for 12.8 million. And when we look at the difference, let's say they lost, which they could actually end up growing is because the smartphone sales have slowed down massively over the past year, but that could still grow. Even though they've lost market share, that could still grow. But let's assume they lost like 20% here. 20%, I think it worked out at like something like a 6% growth over the quarter for telecom and datacom. And that's what we've seen in the last quarter. Look at the growth here in telecom datacom. 216 million grew 23.66%, negative 8.8% quarter over quarter, maybe seasonal factors. Then it grew 15.85%. This is quarter on quarter. 27, quarter on quarter, 27.65, 6.69. So this here now accounts for just shy of 76%. And look at lasers, quarter over quarter, 16, three, flat, four, seven, lasers is growing as well, pretty nicely year on year. So you have a faster growing segment in lasers where the contribution to revenue goes from 9.5% up to 11.3%. You got telecom and datacom, which is growing as well, going from 48% up to 75.9%. The two of those combined are mostly B2B type businesses. And they're selling non-discretionary products. So what I mean by that is the components that they sell are necessary for the end customer to do business. Think of it this way. Let's say I have a warehouse and I have three shifts today, three eight-hour shifts, and there's eight hours that have no light. I have to turn the lights on. Naturally, it's dark outside. If the bulb blows, I can't do the shift unless the light goes on. So in order to get those widgets out the door, I need to replace the bulb. It's non-discretionary. And that's the type of products that they sell to their end customers. So you've got almost 90% of the revenue coming from sort of B2B and it's non-discretionary. And now where we are at the moment, the headwind, the market's really concerned about consumer facing businesses, but the consumer facing businesses is really not accounting for any of the revenue really at all. It's not accounting for much of the revenue at all. The majority, thanks in large part to massive growth is coming from telecom and datacom, which continues to scale up and uh, ramp up in terms of growth. And management have said on the latest earnings report that that segment is very healthy. So as we move forward, because the revenue coming from both of these segments, both of them are growing pretty nicely, now account for almost 90% of the revenue, we're going to start to see the growth come back to the forefront that we haven't seen over the past year because consumer and industrial has been a massive drag going from 190 million down to 64.6 million. So that's where we are at the moment. And all of the fear, I think, is completely misplaced because this is not a consumer-facing business. Yes, they sell some products consumer-facing, but it's a very small segment of the revenue. When we get down here and we look at the customer risk, customer risk, Apple, 2020 was 26% of revenue, 2021, 30% of revenue, 2022, 28.7% of revenue. Cena, more of a network type play, growing. It went from below 10%. To above 10%, 12.6%. Huawei possibly got to do with a slowdown in phone sales or whatever it may, may be. But both of those are, maybe it's networks, maybe it's just a slowdown in general. But both of those, um, what we're seeing is actually a fragmentation in terms of the customer base. The revenue is more B2B. It's not necessarily consumer. And there's a fragmentation in their customer base. Why did Lumentum swap out, or why did Apple swap out Lumentum for Sony? It wasn't because Sony necessarily have the best product. It was more a decision according to the tweets that were sent out. And I don't even know if it's actually been confirmed yet, but it was more a decision based on battery life. Sony was able to preserve the battery a little bit better with their components as opposed to Lamentum. So it's not a case, there hasn't been any sort of uh, commentary that I've seen where it says, this is a case of Sony having a better product. It was, from what I read, entirely driven by battery life. So consumes less battery, meaning it's probably an inferior product, but they're probably not using that specific um, VCSEL, like it's probably not a core feature. I, I, that's sort of speculation that I'm, I'm, I'm throwing into the mix there. Something really interesting happened. Look at gross margins. So this segment here, Apple are notorious for squeezing margins. They're good quality business. They've got consistent uh, revenue growth. They generally don't want competition and they'll put in big orders to get low margins. So as they lose revenue from this consumer and industrial segment over the past couple of years, we've seen gross margins go from 38%, 44.9%, 46%. Margins have actually grown. So this is uh, not necessarily a, a bad outcome. And I think the market, it might, take a, it might take a couple of weeks, it might take a couple of quarters, but it, you know, I think the market will eventually catch on to it. 
So we pop on over here real quickly. Let's have a look at some of its competitors, VIAV, IPGP. Let's look at gross profits. Let's look at EBIT margin. Let's look at multiples paid. So what I wanted to do here is highlight here. So you have a momentum at the top. Highlight the change since 2016 for gross margins. We've gone from 31.5%. Every year, it's been expanding all the way up to 49.7%. Look at VIAV. 62, 61, 60, 60, 61, 62, 62. It's not really ground. It's kind of flat, depending on management's performance, maybe on ordering products, getting the cost of goods sold down, or whatever it may be. It'll kind of fluctuate slightly. IPGP, it's gone from 54 all the way down to 38.9. So that's negative direction for margins. Same with EBIT margins. Look at both of these here. They both have expanding margins. But in 2016, Lamentum's margin went from 2.1% up to 18.1%. It's growing at a faster pace. You're getting margin expansion here. The company's getting more profitable as time goes on. Look at what the market's paying for it. So the market, Lamentum, at a 31.5%, now interest rates were a little bit different back then, but at 31.5% margins, the market was happy to pay roughly 19.65 times. I guess that was partly due to the expected growth in terms of revenue. Today, the market's paying 9.87%, despite 90% of the revenue, which is fast growing, becoming the dominant sort of share of revenue. So we should start to see a kick up in, in uh, earnings over the next couple of years, while profitability starts to kick higher as well. And so the market's actually pricing it way lower. If you actually look, if you comp it against these three companies, What's interesting is we're probably, we probably should be somewhere in around the 15, 16 times mark based on the more profitability and the fact that we're going to see a slight step function in growth. So when I'm looking at Lamentum and everyone's worried about Apple and they're worried about Apple because 28.7% of the revenue last disclosed, 28.7% of the revenue came from Apple. So therefore losing VCSELs must be bad. It's part of their consumer revenue. But... That's not necessarily, in my view, it's not necessarily a, a, a mega risk at all. Uh, you're actually seeing that the concentration is actually fragmenting. Out of nowhere, Sina, which is a network play, is growing at a faster pace. Again, telecom and datacom. Look at Charter Communications. We held it for a brief period. What did they do? They increased capital expenditures by one and a half billion. Look at Comcast. $200 for every single subscriber and capital expenditure is going to be increased. So you're seeing all of these network providers in the telecom space, actually increase capital expenditure right now. That capital expenditure cycle is going to start increasing. So it's, in my view, a good time to start considering Lamentum. I don't necessarily think it's expensive. There was actually a question uh, what my, my views were on the valuation of, of um, let me just have a look. Uh, Lamentum seems quite expensive to me. Okay, so let's go over the valuation. So that's the business, essentially. A lot of concern over consumer and industrial, not really very important. And at the same time, when you look at the multiple relative to the performance and margins and profitability, I think Lumentum should be doing a lot better. So if we pop over to, um, Lumentum, if we pop over to Lumentum using the latest estimates. Uh, 13x enterprise value to EBITDA multiple, which has been the average. We could argue with the higher profit margins that it should be a little bit higher, but it doesn't really matter. We'll just throw in 13 there. That's been the average price share count. A lot of cash offsetting the debt, but here's the thing about the debt. That's convertible bonds. So it's not high risk because that can just convert to equity and it's going to have no drag on the cash balance. So in the current market environment, they're in actually a much better environment because they issued convertible bonds at $99 and $131. So it's trading at $50 and 48 cents as of right now. I think it'll be perfectly fine. So when you factor in the cash flows into 2026, assumptions, obviously the 15% tax rates, ultimately what they're paying, 13X EV to EBITDA multiple, 1% perpetual growth, assuming that the industry, GDP, et cetera, is going to grow at about 1%, uh, which could be conservative, cash, debt, because we've got to get the enterprise value, of course, and the outstanding shares. They're the assumptions that we put in. We took analyst estimates and we dumped them all in here. We kind of figured that changes in working capital probably diminished looking at receivables, payables, inventory, kind of get the sense that we're probably going to see a, a drop of about 17 and a half million on average, not necessarily in a straight line, maybe one year's more than the other, but that's generally what we're looking at. 
we get to a situation where the unlevered cash flows will be 350 up to 578. Now, weighted average cost of capital is what we use as a discount rate. The interest expense on their debts, 3.09. So they do have some debt. It's probably higher than 3.09%, but some of the convertible bonds have interest expense on it as well. But overall, it's 3.09%. It's not a big deal. 1.1 beta. So we're looking at the cost of equity beta 1.1. 10-year yield is probably lower than 3.7 now. It's in free fall. But anyway, we have 3.7, which is probably Friday's close. Equity risk cream of 5.6%. A breakdown of debt equity. We come to just shy of 7% for the discount rate. What we get as a potential, uh, potential fair value on the present value of cash flows, if we're to hold this into 2026 over the next four years, well, over the less than four years, because the end of fiscal year is actually in uh, July. So we'll be holding this for three and a half years we'd be expecting, based on the present value of cash flows, about 150% on the upside from here. So when you take all of those different variables um, and you try and put two and two together, I come to a conclusion that I don't really care about what happens in the next week, month, quarter, because I do know that sentiment can get a little bit wild. And when you're looking at like people focusing on the consumer side, losing VCSEL revenue, in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's a total non-event. Um, and so eventually we'll get past that and the market will start pricing in the asset. And going back to what Joel Greenblatt says, you know, markets, um, uh, he says that if you do the valuation work, the market will agree with you and it will price it correctly. We just don't know when that's going to occur. And so the, the most important takeaway for me is to find an asset that is undervalued. You're going to need to see some sort of negative sentiment surrounded by it in order to get a good price. And you're just going to have to write out volatility. And in time, it should pay out reasonably well. And in this case, I'm, I'm quite excited about Lumentum. Um, prepared to hold this for the next couple of years. And uh, I think there's a lot ahead of this. So I, I made it the largest position in the portfolio. There's a lot of stability on its balance sheet. It's profitable. It's non-discretionary revenue. Sure, it can be cyclical, but it's non-discretionary revenue. Uh, there's a lot to like about it. Uh, there really is. The components that they're selling, it's going into industries like LIDAR, self-driving vehicles, uh, all that sort of stuff. Like all of the trends that like essentially some of the components will go into making the speed of data transfer increase at faster paces, all that sort of stuff. Like cameras, like VCSELs in order to uh, scan faces and whatnot. Like all of these trends, whether it's for A or V or they're at the, they're at the very early stages. So for the next number of years, they should ramp up in terms of the growth for these sort of products. And uh, Lumentum is perfectly positioned to take advantage of those trends. So I'm very excited about this one. The other one is Haynes Brands. Now, Haynes Brands is, it's, it's sort of an ugly story. It's an ugly scenario. But Haynes Brands, essentially, I'm just going to skip to really what the problem is here. The problem with the company is the CFO is a total clown. And what the CFO kept doing was rolling the maturities of their debt every couple of years. And so like, here's the thing, like when you have liabilities, it doesn't matter what it is. You want your liabilities to be fixed. You want certainty on your liabilities and you want some sort of variability on your income. And they're just basic principles. The first property I bought, I paid 5.5% interest rates fixed because I knew what I needed every single month to pay for that loan. So I knew I was never going to default on that loan. Sure, interest rates were coming down. In Ireland, it went from 10% down to 5.5% to fixed it in. When I sold that property like 13 months later, interest rates were down around 3.5%. But it didn't matter because I had certainty on my liabilities. And I'll explain why that's important in a moment. So look what this guy is doing. Let's pop on over the cash flow statement real quickly. Look at this clown has been doing. Literally, year in, year out, look at debt issued and debt repaid. Just refinancing debt every couple of years. They have $3.8 billion worth of debt. And every year, all they were doing is refinancing in a couple of years into the future. The reason why I think this guy is a total dipstick, and I think they let him off scot-free by suggesting that he could leave the company for family issues rather than firing him, but the problem with this is a couple of years ago, interest rates were like 1%, 2%, and 2.5% for a stable business. Haynes Brand's reasonably stable. About 2%, 2.5%, you fix it in for as long as you can. 
10, 12 years, you're not getting lower than 1%, 2%. It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Not over a long period of time. So if they fixed in the interest rate a couple of years ago, they'd be fine. But they didn't. They didn't. They continued to roll it. And now the average interest rate is 7.92% for the company. What does that mean? Well, it means that the interest expense from last year, that was about $150 million, is now $306 million interest expense. So the CFO that got paid $4 million last year has cost the company $150 million. And when you have a look at the share price of Haynes Brands, the share price fairly reflects those challenges. It's gotten absolutely dunked on. So part of this has to do with a restocking, like inventory was built up massively. Go back and listen to what Target were saying. Target were saying ultimately that they had massively built out their stockpile. A lot of it was apparel and therefore they need to work through that inventory. So as we normalize inventory, it's going to have a, a negative impact on Haynes brands. Revenue slowed down off big, massive comps and in tandem with that interest expenses increasing. So last year they got absolutely crushed. crushed. Cash flows last year, negative 470 million, but inventory rebuild was 470 million. Accounts payable, they were paying payables at a faster pace. It was over 200 million. So they didn't necessarily have to be negative cash flow last year, but they were. So when we're looking at Haynes Brands, this is, a, this is a scenario where you've got a reasonably good business. There are cyclical factors, which we'll talk about in a moment because we're getting to the end of those cyclical factors. But this is self-inflicted pain out of stupidity. And the share price goes from $22 down to like $5 and change. And the reason being is higher interest expense, $306 million in interest expense, and a slowdown in terms of orders coming from their partners. 16% of the revenue comes from Walmart. So when we look at Haynes Brands, the biggest problem was their interest expense. And this interest expense was like that there is being refinanced. Sorry, 2024 and 20. So these two notes here were refinanced. And they were refinanced about a week or two ago. They got rid of a 3.5% yielding note and a 4.63% yielding note for a 9% yielding note in 2031. Now, they used some cash. They were able to retire those notes. They used some cash and they put a, and they borrowed another $600 million. So they actually bought the debt levels down, but still, it's 9% interest. And they're forecasting $306 million in interest expense. So the problem here is, is, is interest on debt. Fortunately, in the past three days, we're seeing interest rates plunge, absolutely plunge. So there's another opportunity for them to actually get their interest rate maybe even lower by getting rid of this revolving credit facility. Maybe borrow debt into 2035, maybe at 6%, whatever it may be. But that revolving credit is probably closer to 10% right now. This is from the 10K filing, so we don't have up to date. But that's probably closer to 10% right now. So there's going to be an opportunity, I think, over the next couple of weeks to get the interest expense down even further by refinancing the revolving credit into long-term secured debt. So you get your interest expense down, your bottom line starts to increase and then it starts to recover in terms of your income. Okay, that's part of it. The second part of it is, so solving for the debt issue, I think we've peaked in terms of interest expense. 7.92% is probably close to where we're at. For every 25 basis points increase in interest expense, about $4 million in additional interest expense. I don't. So right now the average is 7.92. I don't think we're going to see another 1% higher than where we currently are. And the company are going to start paying down debt. So the company have guided towards two to three times net debt, right? It's not here. Where is it? I don't know where it is. Give me one second. Um, let's give me one moment. Um, it's pretty important. This one last thing that I want to share. Um, okay. Okay. Let me just see if I can copy all of that and paste it over. Okay, so this is the opportunity that exists for Haynes Brands. It's not a, it's not a like, hey, this is a revolutionary business. It's a scenario that this is a company that royally screwed up, and the equity valuation is fairly reflecting that as of right now. So can I paste all I can? 
all right, just wait for those charts to. So here's the thing, right? So th th there's there's two different factors. There's a cyclical factor. So the industry itself is starting to bottom out in terms of the inventory cycle. So the industry is starting to, to, to bottom out. So ISM PMI fact, uh, ISM PMIs uh, has the manufacturing sector has 18 different sectors. One of them is apparel. But aside from that, they talk broadly about customer inventories. And here's the commentary from Fior, who's the managing director. Customer inventory levels are now at higher end of too low levels as panelist companies continue to manage total supply chain inventories. We're now at the point where we need to start restocking, possibly if demand is sort of consistent. As well as that, when we look at the index itself, so the way in which they report growth is this is in chronological order. And usually it would say in the following order. So if we go down here, it says the 14 industries reporting contraction in February in the following order. This is chronological order with the strongest first. So the strongest growth, reported growth is apparel. So apparel in the manufacturing sector is the strongest manufacturing sector and inventories are too low. So that's great. That's a broad sort of view. The first company to report was Target and they confirmed what, what essentially is happening here that they've gotten through their inventory levels. That doesn't mean that they're going to start restocking, but it does mean that we're kind of at the bottom of this cyclical low in terms of inventory. So that could be a possible tailwind as we move forward. And then the second one I, I mentioned a moment ago about interest expense. And then ultimately, they're guiding towards two to three times debt to EBITDA, which would mean that over the next couple of years, they want to reduce debt by about 1.5 billion. So I just kind of modeled this out, like one and a half billion, they've got 3.859 billion in debt. And the total debt, uh, if they reduce the 1.5 billion would be 2.359 billion plus the current equity, assume that the cash is zero because they just spent a bunch buying back debt. Enterprise value would be 4.277 billion. That would be at today's equity valuation in let's say 2025. That's what we'd be paying for it. Now, if we look at the cash flows, 350, the company are guiding towards 500 million in operating cash flow, 150 million in capital expenditures, 350 million would be free cash flow. How do we get to that? It's pretty simple. Um, they overbuilt their inventory and now destocking an inventory is going to have a positive impact on working capital. So that's actually going to generate free cash flow because they don't need to reinvest. So if we have a look at the cash flow statement, like these guys spent 437 million restocking inventory. This year, look at 2022, it'll actually become a tailwind, all the inventory that they have. That'll become a tailwind to cash flows. And that's what they mentioned on the call as well, is that they're not going to be restocking. They're going to be liquidating inventories. And that's how they get to 350 million this year, this year in enterprise value, or excuse me, in free cash flow. When we look at the Gotham yield that, um, uh, what's his name? Joel Greenblatt, his firm, they use Gotham Yield, it's enterprise value to free cash flow. That's roughly based on this valuation, which we pay today. If they can achieve one and a half billion debt reduction, it's about 8.18%. It's pretty damn good. Following year, 10% growth in cash flows, 9%. And then in 2025, analysts are anticipating 707 million in cash flow, meaning we get a yield in 2025. If they reduce debt by 1500 and hit these numbers, we get a yield of 16.53%. More importantly, by the skin of their teeth, they'd be able to raise enough cash without issuing equity or anything like that in order to get that debt reduction lower. So if we have a look at this, uh, what's a fair multiple that the company could trade at? Well, we can look at historical um, sort of scenarios. Enterprise value 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Okay, 22, we had negative cash flows. But uh, again, a moment ago, I mentioned they paid their accounts payable at a faster pace and they increased massive amount of inventory. So that had a drag on the cash flows. So it was negative last year. But if we look at the prior years, cash flow relative to enterprise value, you have 0 0.91, 4.5, 5.1, 7, 7.8, 4.5, 6.5, 6.7, 6.8, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.9, 6.
275 next year and 500 in 2025. And we only reduced 750 million worth of debt. Now, here's the thing. They refinanced $900 million worth of debt with a new $600 million loan. So they may already have been um, paid down maybe 100, 150 million. We'll know on the next earnings report. But if they only reduced it by 750 million, you're still looking at a pretty decent return by 345%. Like this is really beaten down. The interesting thing is they've already built their inventory, which becomes a tailwind on cash flows. They've suspended their dividend and they're going to use that dividend, which is 206 million to pay down debt. And at the same time, if they can refinance their debt at lower interest expense, we go from 306 million interest expense down. So in my view, I was looking at this and I'm like, it kind of just has to make sense. And so over the next couple of years, it's not about what the company looks like today. It looks like trash, but every company I buy looks like trash in the moment. Like it's not, it's not rare for, it's not uncommon for me to buy a piece of trash and then it turns into a beautiful swan, like in a couple of years, but for two years, it's just a complete dog. And this is one of those. Um, Transocean was one of those, like two years, fundamentals got better, but didn't do anything. And then it goes up like 150% in six months. So this is like one of those plays where if it's just a real kind of map play um, more than anything else. So that's, they're the two additions that we have to the portfolio. And I also added more to Amazon. I increased Amazon by 2% of total AUM. So 3% today. And I think I, I don't know when I don't know. It might've been Friday last week. So maybe Thursday, I don't know. Anyway, um, recently we increased our exposure to Amazon. Here's the thing, like we started off here and we're talking about the total mess with Silicon Valley Bank. Silicon Valley Bank was the lender of last resort to all the innovation companies in the United States. No one else would lend to them and they've just gone bust. So competition for tech, whether it's Amazon, Facebook, doesn't matter. It's just kind of disappeared because there's no funding. And at the same time, as interest rates come down, you have this disinflationary environment, tech tends to do a lot better. So in conjunction with the valuation that I have, which suggests it's worth about $206, technicals, and sort of the macro with what's happening with Silicon Valley Bank, I felt like it was probably a, a pretty good bet at these prices. So this is now the fourth largest position within the portfolio, and I'm feeling pretty good about it uh, over the medium to long term. So let's see how it plays out. It'll need some time anyway. And I added a tiny bit more to Metafast. Metafast is an interesting one. Um, Metafast is a company that doesn't need any cash. They have cash, but they don't need it. Uh, over the past three years, they generated 367 million in cash flow and they distributed back to shareholders 369 million, 2 million more through buybacks and dividends. They pay out like 5.6% dividend and they're buying back, you know, 5, 10%, depending on the year. They do it in lump sums, but they're buying back huge amounts of stock as well. And so this is a company that at the margin, it grows without additional capital and it doesn't require any cash. They distribute it all back to shareholders. So I think this will do very well over the medium to long term. Today, Zim reported. Uh, Zim, it's given back quite a bit, actually. But Zim was kind of interesting because Zim, um, Zim's Q4 dividend is going to be $6.40. So our average price in this is $22.00. So let's just pop on over here. We've been paid give one 2.95 percent. It's not obviously not going to show up. This is not going to show. It'll show up in the performance, but it won't show up in the equity change. Like right now, it'll show that we're down on the position, even though our dividends have been massive. Dividend two is going to be six dollars. Why did I put that as percent? That was $2, and this one here is going to be $6.40. I personally am not a dividend guy. I don't like dividends. And the reason being is the company gets taxed on it, and then I get double whammy taxed on it. So, But in this case, it's kind of interesting because the company is so bloody cheap. And we'll talk about their guidance, which is better than expected. That's why it was up at 1.24%. Um, and obviously their earnings were way better than expected. Like analysts were anticipating $1.92 and it came in at $3.44. So here we have five, one, three, and then we have $9.35 in dividends in two quarters. Two quarters, we received $9.35 in dividends. So our average price is $22 divided by, our excuse me, 
um, 9.35 divided by 22. So 42.5% of our total investment we've already recuperated. 40, this is pretty much a free bet for us. We've got 42.5% recuperated via dividends. Okay, minus our tax rate, but this is, and you got to check tax treaty with, um, if you have a tax treaty with Israel, Spain does. So if you guys are in Europe, you probably do have a tax treaty with Israel. Uh, so you don't get double jeopardy taxed. But 42.5% is, um, is ultimately what we've received in dividends in two quarters. In two quarters. And the share price is in and around a little bit less than what we paid for it. I think that this is probably going to shoot higher. And the reason being is the guidance was a lot better than anticipated. EBITDA is still coming in pretty damn hot. Dry bulk index is up 130% in the past three months, four months. Um, these guys are obviously given some warnings naturally, but they're adjusted EBITDA for next year. The guidance is 1.8 to 2.2 billion. Still doing a pretty damn good job. It's massively, it has a massive short float. I mean, what's the short float on this thing? Maybe that's why it was up at 24% earlier today. I don't know. Uh, or 12%. I think actually the latest numbers are suggesting that's closer to 20%. That's a decent short interest on better than expected performance with a huge dividend payout. Like $6.40. $6.40 on a company trading at 21.35 is pretty damn good in my view. So we're getting 42.5% in dividends in two quarters for holding this stock. Uh, can't lose money here. Um, be very hard to lose money in Zim. Um, even if it went down like 20%, it'd be very hard to lose money. Outside of that, I, I'm just going to go over to questions because I don't really have much else to say. Uh, if I weren't fully invested right now, where would you be putting the capital? Well, two weeks ago, I had 19% cash. I only put a lot of that cash to work in the last week or two. And what I decided to put it into was Lumentum. Lumentum has 7% the portfolio. I decided to increase the exposure last week by 2% into Amazon. Um, I put half a percent into Metafast. Um, I put it down here on the lows. So it's probably back at break even. What else did I do? Um, can't remember. Baxter, I built Baxter out even further. Baxter is now one of the largest positions in the portfolio as well. I added another 2% to Baxter. Uh, and then Haynes Brands, 4% went into Haynes Brands. Uh, that made up most of it. Haynes Brands finished building out Baxter, built out Amazon further, Metafast, and Lumentum. Um, Warner Bros, Warner Bros I, I, you know, I'd be interested in adding some more to Warner Bros. I think, I think you can get down to 11, 12. If it does, I'll increase the position for sure. Uh, and outside of that, there was 2% went into Amadeusis, which we went over before. Oh, yeah. And Alpha Metallurgic has about 2.5%, 3%. Really simple thesis. The company is buyback machine, total buyback machine. Outside of that, I haven't done anything. I am contemplating whether I should buy more Citigroup. I think this is kind of overdone, personally. Um, We'll see. Uh, so that's that, 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 that'd that be it. This is a qualitative and free macro and microeconomic course. Cheers, Raz. Um, nice to see you too, Eddie. Uh, hey, Rob, can you please touch on Overstock and T0? T0 recently released a disclosure statement for the nine months ending September 22nd. They only have 77 million in cash. Thoughts on this? Look, they are a company that's growing pretty quick. They've just actually launched a new platform um, which I have in my bookmarks for accredited investors. Let me just open and cancel that. So they do have uh, a new plat. Like they are investing money. Like they're not raising money to leave it in their cash in in the balance uh, in the, in their accounts. They're 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 raising money because they have a home to put it in to generate returns. Simplify Investor is a subsidiary that was bought by T Zero. And this is for onboarding accredited investors, et cetera, for building out this sort of uh, liquidity in secondary markets, that type of idea. Um, so they are spending the money. Like, I'm not worried about the cash balance going down. That's ultimately what we're anticipating. 77 million is still a lot of money to have. And I think they're getting closer to, 
yeah, I think they're getting closer to um, really ramping up. Uh, you've seen most crypto brokers got shut down. I think the last one was last week, gone. Um, there's a hell of a lot of regulation. And T0 has already done the hard work. There's not really anything out there that's regulated like T0. To, to use blockchain and a digital token, TZ or OP, in order to create a secondary market for, you know, real estate investment tra- or real estate uh, syndications, private equity, venture capital, all that sort of stuff. So they, they are ramping up. It, you know, the information sort of trickled down to us, but uh, they have launched some new products and services. So it's just a matter of waiting patiently, but I'm not too concerned about it. Uh, what are my thoughts on stock-based compensation at GoPro? My concern is that they appear to be free cash flow positive with a strong net cash position on the face of it, but share buybacks are being offset. But yeah, and and to be honest, that really pissed me off, Alex, because if you go to the latest quarter and you go GP or O investor relations, like, anyway, if you go to the latest presentation, like this really, really got under my skin. Um, uh, GoPro announces four quarter results. Um, and they specifically say they bought back to offset stock-based compensation. It's really pissed me off because that's that's an expense. It's an expense. Either you pay them in cash or you pay them in equity. But if you pay them in equity, it's still an expense. And if you're buying back the stock, again, it's still an expense. Um, average selling price increased. Uh it's in it's in this anyway. Um, repaying debt and repurchasing forty million dollars in stock. Okay, so they go on to say that it was to offset stock based compensation, which really bugged the hell out of me to be honest. Because it's you know it is an expense. You shouldn't be gloating like, hey, listen, you know we didn't dilute you. We bought the stock back. Yeah, but you drained my cash out of the damn business. It's not having net positive impact, but it's here somewhere. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's they, they mentioned it on the call. There it is there. In 2022, GoPro bought back $40 million in stock, which covered our stock-based compensation expense for the year. And we plan to continue to execute on our stock by, stock repurchase plan in 2023. Um, GoPro also retired $125 million of debt. That pissed me off. Like they're, they're not having any net change other than draining cash out of the business. But anyway, yeah. I'm looking at GoPro at the moment because I'm wondering, you know, like one of the reasons I closed Nokia. I think Pekka Lundmark is a phenomenal CEO. I think the management are fantastic. But here's the problem. When you look at Nokia, right? Look, I I personally don't want single-digit returns. I want double-digit returns. I want high double-digit returns. And in order to get that, you, you kind of got to execute really well, but you got to, you got to really balance the earnings growth in your favor as well. You got to get some multiple expansion with higher margins, which you're doing. You got to get a couple of points on the top line of growth and you got to buy back some stock to get your earnings per share growing at a faster pace. So the top line is growing one, two, three percent, whatever. Margins are expanding 12, 13, 14 percent, executing really well. Here's the problem. Look at the cash flow they're expected to generate. So this is in. So let's have a look at it in U.S. dollars. Cash flow in. OK, it's 2023. This year, 1.7, 2.8, 2.7, 3.1, 3.3 billion dollars. So they're anywhere from two to three are over in billions of dollars is what's forecasted for cash flow. It's very easy to predict business. Um, it's a long-standing business in the network space. It's very easy to predict what their future cash flows are likely to be. Let's pop on over here. U.S. dollars, the market cap. Let me just adjust that. We're at what 106. So 25 multiplied by 1.06. It's about $26.5 billion in equity valuation. So we, and obviously they've got a net cash position, but let's just avoid that for a second. If we take, um, if we take uh, 2.5 on average divided by 26.5, you have a 9.43% free cash flow yield, not factoring what's in the bank, but you have a 9.4% free cash flow yield on your market, on your market cap. So what do you do with all that cash? Um, you can invest it, but they're currently sitting on they're sitting on 8.5 billion exclude out the debt you still have like 4 or 5 billion net cash you could literally buy back 10% of your shares outstanding 
still have cash left over, two billion left over, net cash left over, your your free cash flow per share increases and your equity valuation skyrockets. Management came out with a two-year stock buyback of 650 million. It's just too conservative. In order to get that high double digit return, they gotta be more aggressive. Stupid idea to do dividends. Really dumb idea. When you're in this situation where your stock's trading at below seven times EBITDA, you should be buying back like crazy. And as the stock goes above seven times EBITDA, issue a dividend. Gets a little bit too expensive to buy back your stock, distribution is from cash back that way. Wait patiently, build up your stack, stock balance. As it gets below that valuation again, turn on the buyback machine. They've got, they're swimming in cash, but they're too conservative. And that was the biggest problem I had. GoPro, swimming in cash, uh, too conservative. This, this stock here, like if you look at, Charter Communications, the big massive run in Charter Communications over here, right? See that big massive run for like years, 15 years? They were leveraged buybacks. They were literally borrowing money and buying back their stock because they had consistent earnings. That was all leveraged buybacks. Nokia don't need to do leveraged buybacks and they could get this type of performance. And I've sent an email. I sent a letter. I sent a bunch of tweets to Pekka Lundmark on Twitter. Eventually, they authorized a 650 million euro buyback. And I'm pounding my head off the wall at the missed opportunity that they have. Finland's on the border of Russia. So obviously the market prices it down. Why? Most of their businesses, mainly in Europe and the United States, 50-50. Very little exposure in China, but it's growing. Anyway, my view was that uh, Nokia had a great opportunity. I'm looking at GoPro in the same scenario. And I, I don't know if they have the, the guts really to generate those type of returns. We'll see. Um. Concerns about Tupperware from terrible to bad, so up or even a comeback story or going to extra terrible bankruptcy. So with Tupperware, the equity is being crushed. Absolutely, it's being crushed. But here's the thing. If you actually look at the results for last year, what ended up happening? Well, they bought back a bunch of stock, paid down some debt, and the cash balance went from 300 million down to 100 million. That's cutting it really tight, right? So the cash balance is drained and there's still a lot of uncertainty as to whether these guys can actually turn things around. Um, as of right now, it's only about 65 basis points of the portfolio. It's very small. Uh, what I, I'm following this real closely because if I start to see a glimmer of hope where it starts to turn around, and I think there's still a chance that it turns around, but if there is a glimmer of hope where it does turn around, I'll ramp the position up. The average cost can come down massively because you don't need a lot of capital to get the average cost down. If this ends up playing out, I mean, the average cost based on the present value of cash flows, based on the estimates that we have today, um, it's coming in at $35 per share, right? So the upside's 13x from today's prices. So I'm following this really closely. Maybe I double down, maybe I triple down because it's a small position, but it may not be at $2.47. It might come at like $5, but the fundamentals will be more stable and there'll still be plenty of meat on the bone. So it's not that I'm, I'm leaving it there at the moment because the potential upside is kind of bizarre, but there is, a, there's a lot of challenges. The challenges are it's still a levered play and they drain a lot of their cash. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, CEO was saying, the CEO was saying that ultimately what they want to do is uh, stabilize this year. So get earnings stable. I mean, I think that's fairly reflected. The equity is what, it's only $100 million in, in equity. So if they can stabilize, get the debt down a small bit, they haven't, like on the latest earnings, they haven't breached their liquidity covenants. So they're still in the game. They're still in the game, but there's a bit of work to be done. Um, why has it absolutely fallen off a cliff the last three days? If regional banks are in trouble and deposits are going to be a challenge for certain institutions, um, Tupperware might be doing business with a regional bank and they need that 110 million. And so that's probably what it is as of right now, but I'm keeping an eye on it. Uh, I would, I, I could easily see myself if the fundamentals probably take a quarter or two, but if the fundamentals pick up, I could easily see myself ramping up that position for sure. Um, it's an interesting one where the equity is in my view, pretty damn low. Like this is a business that has the potential to do 150 million in free cash flow. The equity, so what do you do with that? Well, then you pay down your debt. The equity is trading at 109 million today. So if the fundamentals get a little bit better and there's a clear path moving forward, like what we've seen with the refinancing opportunity over at um, 
Transocean. It was the refinancing that really got the fundamentals improving and then the stock price starts to fairly reflect that. If we see something similar like that with Tupperware, I'll ramp up the position. And so Transocean started out as about 1.5% of my portfolio, initially went up, and then it was down 50%. Now, I didn't add any down here, unfortunately, but it's kind of same scenario. Rallies up, comes back down, and I ramp up the position. So I still, I didn't pay bottom dollar, but I bought a more stable business. I averaged in at a higher price, but I bought a more stable business that's played out really well so far. So that's sort of how I'm kind of looking at Tupperware at the moment. They're not out of the game. They just drained their cash balance last year. If you really want to take a step back, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there for sure. Uh, thoughts on US Hegemy and its perils um, published by China Republic. Uh, look, unless the Federal Reserve royally F up and you end up with a situation where there is a chain of defaults where... There's no backstop on deposits. The US dollar is the only game in town. And the reason being is China want to have US hedge or China want to have hegemony or they want to be the reserve currency. I, I don't know if they really desire to be that. But nobody is going to use the currency. It's not convertible. There's no transparency. They've got an onshore and an offshore currency. Find me somebody that be outside of Iran or Russia or somewhere like that, where it's an autocratic region, but find me another country or even business that's going to do business in the West anyway with China in their currency. Nobody. So then, okay, so it's, let's say it's not China. It's not going to be the European euro. Let's say it has to be a basket of commodities. This is another one that's floated. It's going to be a basket of commodities. Well, let's just take one commodity. Let's have a look at crude oil. So crude oil here in January 2020 dropped 82% in three, four months or five months into May. And then it rallied 10X. And this is in the space of two years. So nobody wants to use Bitcoin as a reserve currency because the volatility is too high. So if the volatility is too high in Bitcoin and that's um, a reason not to, to use Bitcoin, why would you use a basket of commodities when all of them are as volatile as well? So if you, if you pair it all back, like I'm open to the idea that there's going to be like the U.S. loses their hegemony, but to what? Like what's out there that's really like, and here's the thing, China's population apparently is declining at a faster pace. So China's population is declining at a faster pace. They're going to see inflationary pressures, massive inflationary pressures, same as the wage crisis in the U.S. What's that going to mean? Well, their manufacturing hub is going to diminish. Cost of labor is going to be too high. It's already offshoring over to India. And so where is the growth going to come from in China? If the population's declining, I definitely think maybe 10 or 15, maybe 20 years, India is a very young country, maybe the rupee at some point. Remember, gangs ran, ran America back in the early 1900s. So when you look at India, yeah, I think they have similar values to the West. Quasi-democracy with a lot of work to be done, but it's a young country as well. 60% uh, of the population is below the age of 26 years of age. And so a lot of growth could come from there. And even when you look at like the ETF for India, like this is one I'm very considering putting into the portfolio at the right price. It was trading at like 20 times earnings, uh, which I thought was a little bit too rich relative to a number of different um, uh, indexes. So it looks like it's correcting and it has been correcting, but somewhere like down around 35, 33, there's a hell of a lot of growth at the right price. You could buy this and sit on it for a number of years. India could be a very interesting place. But again, it's like they don't have the financial infrastructure to be the world or their currency. So U.S. hegemony, like who's going to replace the dollar and over what time horizon? I don't see anyone doing it this decade. So I think the dollar is just going to, we're stuck with the dollar, essentially. I haven't read, if that's a paper, I um, I haven't read it, so... I wouldn't listen to anything out of China anyway. It's generally propaganda. Uh, maybe sometime uh, it's about time you look into Dropbox again. Yeah, so Dropbox, in my view, I mean, somewhere around, the, because I really want, so I was looking at this, obviously. We went over this in, in last live streams, but we're looking at this as an A, B, and a C. It looks to be playing out anyway. Um, I'd want to see, like, here's the thing with Dropbox. It's a great business, very stable but the relative performance for, or the relative opportunity that exists in the market is so much better. 
um, like Lumentum as an example, uh, on a normalized basis next year. They don't have a lot of transactions, but if you normalize their net income, it's about 10 times earnings. It's not an expensive business. And it's got a lot of growth ahead of it, a lot of free cash flow, step function and growth as well. It's trading a little bit cheaper. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. And that was one of the reasons why we closed out Dropbox. Um, Dropbox, because there's not a lot of growth, uh, I, I'd really want to see down around the 15, mid, mid-teens. Um, and then it becomes very interesting again. But yeah, that could be one. The reason why I liked it so much at 19 previously, I mean, if you go back to late 2021, there's very little value in the market. There was very, very, very little value in the market down around then. Like most of the stuff had ripped higher. So I was invested in financials, oil and gas companies, Dropbox, number of businesses like that. There was not a huge amount of value. You're kind of forced into a couple of different names. Um, Today, it's different. There's a lot of sectors that have been beaten down massively, and there's a lot more sort of opportunity. So I guess that's probably why it sold off. I guess, I don't know, maybe other people were kind of looking at it the same way we were. But um, yeah, it's it's a very stable business, but there's a lot of relative cheap businesses. And at the right price, probably mid-teens, probably it makes a lot more sense. Uh, thoughts on Overstock's latest quarter. Johnson said that revenues will be down by 35, 40% for the first half of this year. Will they ever get close to pandemic levels of profitability in the future? Um, they should. Yeah, yeah. So I mentioned this on the last, last live stream. Um, I talk about Overstock on every live stream. But you have to understand like, Overstock in 2020 had a huge demand pull forward, massive demand pull forward. And then that moderates, fine. And that's ultimately what happened here, moderation. This is the furniture business. I'm not talking about Medici. And then that moderates, and then we normalize the cycle, and then we'd start to pick back up. That's sort of how it works. So we started off talking about, obviously, Jerome Powell, the mistakes that they've made, which has ultimately led to you know a, a banking crisis not for large caps, but more so for regional banks. Um, interest rates went so high, like mortgage rates went above 7%. Home prices last year were up 8.8% despite a 7% mortgage rate. So we peaked in June, we rolled over from June, but over year over year in December, it was up 8.8%. House prices actually went up last year despite 7% mortgage rate. Why? The whole market seized. You have 98% of homeowners that have a fixed rate mortgage averaging 3.3% yield, 98%. At the margin, only 2% have adjustable rate mortgages. So 2% of households will get squeezed, but 98% of households are perfectly fine. Fixed rate mortgages, long-term fixed rate mortgages. And so you have a situation where people that have 3.3% fixed rate mortgages in an environment where house prices were not coming down, and even right now they haven't come down massively, if they're to sell their house, they have to buy a new house and they have to pay double the interest, more than double the interest rate. It's over 7%. It's probably lower now after the last couple of days. So what ended up happening was housing market ground to an absolute halt. That's why I got out of Zillow as well is because these guys generate the revenue from the number of transactions in the housing market. And if there's going to be less transactions, well, they're not going to generate as much revenue as they're guiding towards. Overstock similar because furniture sales are correlated with uh, um, the real estate market. And so furniture sales, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't anticipating mortgage rates got up to 7%, just to be very clear. So if you want to criticize my analysis, it's, it's on the expectation of mortgage rates being lower and activity being reasonably strong. Um, but overstock is in sort of like, it, it, it's, it's in a weird sort of scenario where Housing market slows down, impacts furniture sales, but they're still profitable, just not generating huge amounts of profit. The business model itself is very durable. They've got 355 million in cash. They bought back some stock. They also reinvested in grain chain. They're still investing in Medici Ventures to keep our equity ownership in those businesses quite high. So they're doing all the right things in a challenging market environment and the housing market will come back. Now what's changed versus pre-pandemic? Tons of stuff. Pre-pandemic, Jonathan Johnson came in in 2019. And when he came in, this was a company that was gushing cash. They were investing massively into MedEC Ventures. It was negative cash flow year in, year out. Previous, Patrick Byrne gets kicked out the door. Jonathan Johnson comes in. He spins off MedEC Ventures, invests over eight years, 46 million, puts 10 million into T0. And then he starts focusing on the business. For the first time in years, in 2019, they start focusing on the business. And when they start focusing on the business, what did they do? Well... If you look at the quadrant, you've got value, luxury, et cetera. 
they start moving into different parts of the quadrant. So they wear a value brand and then now they've moved, they were a discount brand. Then they moved into value and then they're moving into luxury where they're taking on products from a number of different retailers globally. Right? So they're moving into different quadrants. They don't hold any of the inventory, so it's not a problem. And they're moving into different quadrants. And ultimately what they're, they're likely to do is um, increase the amount of potential revenue that they can earn because they've got a, a broader SKU level. I think they've got 4 million SKUs now to mention on the latest call. So you've got 4 million SKUs now. Um, when you look at Bed Bath & Beyond, what's the significance of Bed Bath & Beyond filing chapter 11 for overstock? Well, if you're a mom and pop store selling furniture and you sell stuff through Bed Bath & Beyond, when are you going to get your money? When is that accounts payable essentially going to be released? It could take a very long time. And so the trust with companies like Wayfair, as an example, Bed Bath & Beyond has gone down massively. And a company like Overstock, they're actually, I'll show you the conference call because you mentioned it. But essentially what you're seeing is they're stealing market share. So right now, they're stealing market share, moving into different quadrants, moving geographically into new areas such as Canada. So they've increased the size, the footprint of their business. When interest rates do come down, the housing market, which is cyclical, starts turning its wheel again, they're going to start improving really well. And so it should be as big, if not bigger, as we move forward because of all the work that's being done. It's just very hard to see that work because of what happened in the real estate market. It will come back. Um, but you'll see it here, like CFO had mentioned... Um, it was the CFO. Oh, it was in the Q&A. I was asked about inventories. Uh, also on the... Uh, highly competitive, highly... Pro yeah, and that's another thing, right? So it's highly promotional. So Overstock don't hold their inventory. They sell other people's inventory. Other businesses that hold inventory that are bloated in inventory, massively discounted. So for a period of time, there's going to be a competition there because it's a highly promotional backdrop. Um, there it is here. One question. I'll go back to the queue. So Jonathan, can you compare the contrast today's? Okay, so that's not it. You guys have been very helpful in providing KPIs. Uh, uh, I just want to add regarding overstock. <laughs> They also partnered partnered with uh, Club O members partnered up with um, Mastercard as well. Like a lot has happened. A lot has happened. Uh, I don't know where it is. I'm probably not going to find it right now. I wanted to focus on the active customer base. Uh, it's here somewhere. I think that the guidance. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I, I think it's here somewhere. There's a lot of stuff anyway. It's here anyway. If you want to go through the conference call, they directly mentioned that they're seeing hundreds of more. A lot of discussion this morning around the highly competitive. Yeah, it's here somewhere. They're seeing, anyway, it's there somewhere. Uh, it's here somewhere. They're, they've partnered up with hundreds of new partners, and mainly it's got to do with the poor financial health of their competitors. So that gives them a competitive edge. Anyway, when the housing market starts to pick back up again, it should be fuel to the fire for overstock. So it, it, the furniture business is a very attractive business because it doesn't have a lot of downside and it has a lot of variable upside. But at the same time, like Medici Ventures is where we're going to make a lot of money and T0 is starting to ramp up. Uh, David Goon is one of the founder, the founding employees over at Ice Markets 20 odd years ago when he was saying like T0 today uh, has easily uh, the same opportunity to become the same market cap as are, are greater than uh, ice markets, which is a $60 billion company. So the opportunity in T0 is massive because they're the first company using blockchain and focusing on, um, focusing on, uh, what do you call it? My brain is starting to fry. We're heading for the two hour mark. Um, I can't remember. Lost my train of thought, but anyway, uh, on overstock. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty happy with this. Um, I'm not, I'm not really that concerned about it. It's in a diversified portfolio. Certain things are going to work. Certain things aren't like, look at small caps are down 1.2% today. We do have some sort of sensitivity to small caps. So 
We do have a lot of small caps, like look at the variance in the portfolio. Some companies doing very well, some not doing very well, but hopefully like Tupperware is only 65 basis points in the portfolio. Citigroup's a big position. Transocean's a big position. The rest of those are sort of mid to small. Lamentum's a big position. But on the plus side, like Plain Sparks medium and medium and whatever. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's going to be, performance will be variable. Uh, thoughts on Gen Digital? Not going to comment on any companies today uh, that I'm not invested in. Eddie, hi, uh, Rob, do you have some Discord or way for us to, for us mortals to be connected with you more often? Love your content, miss your old channel. Uh, cheers, Eddie. Um, to be honest, I just focus. Uh, going to do live streams more often. I'm actually, I'll show you exactly what I'm going to do. I don't know if you guys want this or not, but. I have, uh, I'm building out sort of little videos to help you guys. Like when I talk about this stuff, like fixed income breaks down into a number of different variables, like yield curves, zero, zero coupon bonds, par yield curves. So look at what's going on right now, par versus unrealized losses, high yield debt, subordinate debt, loans, all that sort of stuff, swap curves, convertibles, exchangeable bonds, repo, short duration, all this sort of stuff is in the news right now, I'm planning on, I just started this one. Did I do this like two days ago or something? But um, I'm looking at just creating two minute videos, dumping them out there. So that when I talk about this stuff on this channel, when I talk about this stuff, you guys can check it out. Um, so I'm going to work on that for right now and we'll see where we go from there. We'll do live, live streams. But I have like for financial analysis, like for those of you, like sometimes I invest in a company. You might look at it and say, well, why do you invest in that company? If you have a fair idea, you might be able to break this stuff down and uh, you'd be like, ah, I see exactly what he sees. And so I, I'm still working on it. I'm just going to, it's going to be pretty in depth, but uh, I'll do that. I did start a different education channel, but I kind of got sidetracked. So I'm going to try to do it again. And then live streams and stuff like that. Uh, um, uh, interesting in Dropbox at these prices. Yeah. So, that was mentioned just above here. Um, in the mid, mid teens, Dropbox starts to look very interesting. The thing about Dropbox is, as I mentioned before, they don't have a huge amount of growth. Cheap, yes, not a huge amount of growth. So you got to balance that up. You got to pay a lower multiple in order to get multiple expansion and sort of hit your target rate that you're looking for. Um, you mentioned considering a position in India ETF. Do you follow Sweden or Mexico? I love Mexico. And actually, Vivek, what's his name? Wamashrama, uh, I can't remember. Uh, his name is, follow the guy anyway. Vivek Ramashwamy. Uh, Vivek is announced that he's going to run for president. I think the guy has a really good chance at winning. I think he appeals to the political center in the US. Uh, there's a lot of wonky stuff going on recently over the past couple of years. A lot of people are not really interested in that. They're just interested in you know, real things as opposed to whatever, virtue signaling, whatever. And he definitely appeals to that voter base, center, right, slightly. And I think he, there's a possibility he could win. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is the guy had said that he's going to designate Mexican cartels terrorists. Why? Well, he can send in the U.S. military and wipe them out in a weekend. And he would wipe them out in a weekend. Mexico has a lot of corruption. And it's run by cartels. And I think if you solve for the cartel issue, Mexico is a super interesting place because you have a young workforce. It's 20% cheaper to manufacture versus China. And it's across the border. Tesla were the first one to move across the border for manufacturing. Makes a lot of sense to increase those synergies. But you can't do business with narco traffickers. You need to get rid of those. So far, like this year, well, since 2020, Mexico has done incredibly well. But in 2024, next year, if Vivek starts, to, if, if he starts to move ahead in the polls, and this trades at a, a much lower multiple right now, would be suggesting that we're pretty close to a potential top here. I mean, if you can solve for the cartel issue in Mexico, U.S. have a very sort of close relationship with Mexico. Mexico becomes the manufacturing hub for the United States. Both of them get rich together. U.S. has an age, aging population. I find that really interesting. Um, so we'll see. I don't know. I'm just sort of speculating on a potential president in two years. 
Who knows? The guy not, may not even make it. Who knows? So if something like that occurred, other than that, I mean, I invested in a company called AG, which is a silver miner. I invested in these back in 2015, 2016, uh, heading into Trump's presidency, uh, where he said he's going to build a big wall. And the reason why I invested in this company is it wasn't actually really based on the silver prices. It was based on silver prices not going down, but the Mexican peso getting obliterated. So the cost of production for silver miner, they've got six mines in Mexico. But investing in uh, First Majestic, it really gave me a little bit of uh, an insight into some of the challenges that um, Mexico faces with, relate, with regards to the cartels. I didn't realize like there's a lot of hostage situations and all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, if Mexico is really going to be a proper partner to the U.S., they'll get ridiculously rich. Um, I think that needs to be solved for Vivek's the only one that's talking about it. So I'm sure AMLO would uh, would definitely agree to it. We'll see. I don't know. But yeah, I like uh, I like Mexico. Uh, Sweden, richly priced, but Sweden have a phenomenal, like obviously we're invested in evolution, but I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's a regulation on um, M&A. Uh, I don't know. Well, like their tax deals on m and I don't know whether it's management schools. I don't know whether it's corporate culture, but there's something about Sweden. Them, they all have really high profitability rates. They all have fantastic growth. Their execution is phenomenal. Sweden's really interesting, but you pay top dollar for it. So, uh, so yeah, it's um, it's an interesting one. Sweden's an interesting one. Mexico is also an interesting one. Sweden is a little bit richly priced. Uh, I don't know what the index is trading at, but their company is broadly like Evolution is not a cheap company. Um, their indexes broadly are a little bit richer. Uh, I, I would say, uh, India valuation is getting a little bit more reasonable. Mexico, let's give it a little bit of time, but it could be interesting for sure. Uh, I understand why you don't cover companies that are not in the portfolio. Yeah, I kind of, you know, it's, uh, looking forward to more educational videos. Uh, any thoughts on building Citigroup out as, yeah, that's, I mentioned that earlier. I mean, I think, uh, to be down 6.7% is a little bit unjust. Because Dodd Frank was adjusted, Com ass companies that have assets under two hundred and fifty billion, these companies um, don't have to report unrealized losses. Citigroup does. So when you look at Citigroup liquidity, they're fine. And what you're probably seeing is a migration out of um, regional banks into J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, and Citigroup because of the changes in Dodd Frank. These guys weren't buying back stock because they had to increase their liquidity ratios. So now what could happen is you have a big massive influx, um, like $43 billion left Silicon Valley Bank. Let's say that went to Citigroup. Could be very interesting. Could be very interesting because that 43 billion then goes into the overnight reverse repo, immediately collects 5% per year. They're not passing any of that on, very small amount of it. So it could be a massive tailwind, but when you have sort of these systemic uh, like tail events, like what we're seeing at the moment, uh, all assets tend to panic. But this is very much like XLF. Uh, well, how is JP Morgan doing? JP Morgan's very conservative. Yeah, JP Morgan's holding up very well. These guys are very conservative. Um, Jamie Dimon really knows what he's doing, but you're going to pay top dollar. It's 1.4 or five times book value. You're going to pay top dollar for it. But uh, JP Morgan, even JP Morgan is down. So it's only down 1.2% on the day, but you know, it is still down off its highs. It's still eight and a half percent. What's Bank of America? Bank of America is down quite a bit. That's a well-run bank as well. Moynihan's pretty, uh, pretty solid CEO. Like even Schwab, like Charles Schwab is in a lot of trouble as well. Like a lot of these banks are, are in trouble. Citigroup, I don't think it should be selling off quite like it is, but, and that's already a big position. I'm wondering now, is this a fantastic opportunity or not? So I'm just sitting on my hands for right now. Um, we'll see, but yeah, it's on my mind. Thoughts on Warner Bros. last quarter. I thought it was excellent. Yeah, I really liked it. I really liked uh, Warner Bros. last quarter. Uh, we did go over it in the last update. Warner Bros. Discovery earnings came out. Naturally, if you go to social media, people will be like, wow, that was horrible. Earnings were disgusting. This should be a zero. 
But I'm, look, you know, I don't really care what anyone else thinks anyway. I mean, it's our investments. We've got a specific time horizon and we're planning on holding it for a couple of years to realize the potential of the essential opportunity. So I don't really care what anyone else thinks. But with Warner Bros., yeah, I mean, what did they do? Last year, they cut an awful lot of content. And the reason why they were cutting stuff, like I think it was Batwoman. Batwoman, the company previously spent hundreds of millions of dollars on Batwoman. Like it was a big production. But the problem is it's not a big audience that's going to attract. And in order to make it a big audience, the capital investment for marketing was way too high. So they used it as a tax, a tax advantage write-off. There's a number of different movies like that where they were big production. They used them as tax advantage write-offs. And now they're going back to their core. They got rid of those, used them as tax advantages. We didn't pay for that. That was the previous management, at and on that. Movies were already developed. And so what they're doing now is they're focusing on, they brought out Hogwarts, I think it was. It was a Hogwarts the video game. Um, anyway, Harry Potter. They're bringing out a new Batman and Superman. And they're focusing on franchises that are incredibly valuable. There's an appetite to see new content. And that'll have a very high return on investment. So they're focusing their capital expense. They brought the capital expenditures down massive. They're focusing on home runs, um, paying down debt. They're expecting like they're very, like they've got ex very aggressive guidance. Actually, they're expecting to get their debt to EBITDA down to was it below three? Which look, I, I wouldn't doubt Zaslav. I'll tell you why. He'd done it already with um, with Discovery when they bought scripts. Uh, Gunnar at the end of Gunnar's statement here. Is it here? Uh, Gunnar. He talks about what their guidance is. Sorry, wait a second. This isn't the earnings call, is it? No. It's conference. There it is there. It's at the end of. Gunnar, he's saying, okay, so there's going to be $4 billion in synergies. They only realized a billion so far. So there's, they've only realized a billion. There will be $4 billion. Um, their guidance on debt is to get to, like they are $49 billion in debt. They have a lot of debt. So number four, driving overall efficiency and free cash flow, conversions towards a near-term goal of one-third to one-half conversion of adjusted EBITDA with longer-term upwards of 60% goal. Naturally, we're laser focused on deleveraging the balance sheet, uh, where I see net leverage very comfortably inside four times by the end of 2025. Right now, it's at five times. So that's a 20% either reduction on debt or some sort of growth in terms of EBITDA or a little bit of both. And by mid-2024, which is only, you know, at this point, 15 months away, 2.5 to three times. So it's, they're now at a point where they're expecting to massively deleverage. And this is where it gets exciting because the equity is mispriced if that if they do delever to two and a half, three times. Because they keep paying down their debt, use the EBITDA to reduce their debt levels. Interest expense becomes a tailwind. They're paying out over a billion, one and a half, I think it's 1.7 billion in interest expense. It becomes very exciting. Um, I really like it. If I could get down, if I could get down to somewhere, like I know it's the, I think it's the second biggest position in the portfolio. Um, if it could get down to like $12, $11, uh, yeah, I'd buy it. I'd buy more. Um, yeah, so so Tom, yeah, I agree. I'm, like, here's the thing, right? Uh, last year and a half has been really difficult as an investor. And people forget that Warren Buffett's generated 20% per year for 60 years. He's not the best investor. He's just been doing it for so long, right? That's why Warren Buffett's like, wow. A lot of investors have smashed his performance. They just haven't done it for as long. Look at Peter Lynch, 29% compounded, but only for 14 years. No one has done 20% for 60 years. That's It's not that 20% is difficult or wow, it's 20% for 60 years. But people forget that in 1970 into 1974, so 70, 71, two, three, four, five years, how much did Buffett make? Zero. He didn't make anything. And so you go through periods like investing is like, I, I genuinely think the it's not that people can't make a lot of money investing. It's more so that they don't have the stomach or the patience to allow the compounding sort of occur. Sometimes the stock doesn't do anything for a long period of time. It doesn't mean it's a bad investment. It's just market hasn't caught onto it yet. It just takes some time. Reasonable time horizons, diversification. Last year was pretty difficult. Warner Bros. 
I think a lot of people gave up on this stock. I, I, I'm almost certain a lot of people gave up on this stock at much lower prices than when it, when it, where it currently is. Uh, the fundamentals got better. Um, I know I've been adding more the whole way down, but the fundamentals have just been getting better, certainly from my analysis anyway. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of time. But yeah, like this is this is a company where I've always thought was massively undervalued, but there was a lot of sort of, you know, it's, it's a learning curve as well. Like a reverse Mars trust is not something I invested in before. And in a falling share price environment with higher neutral rates, I mean, it becomes a debt spiral. That's what happened to it. it became a debt spiral. And then as we get into this year, all that's in the rear view mirror, share prices up 60% in no time. I think we're now starting to re-rate it. But if you don't have the patience and you're not following the fundamentals, I mean, yeah, the latest quarter, there's been a lot of trash quarters, but the latest quarter has shown a lot of glimmer of, of hope. Uh, not just a glimmer of hope, but there's a solid and tangible plan. How are they going to get there? They're going to use their EBITDA to pay down debt. They're going to reinvest a smaller amount of capital expenditures in high ticket, fat pitch swings, looking at like video games for argument's sake, with Hogwarts, looking at Batman, Superman, new fran- new movies for those franchises, which I think one of them hasn't had a new movie. Superman hasn't had a new movie in a decade. They're going to be fat pitches to generate revenue. And... Um, it's a pretty straightforward plan. It's a pretty straightforward plan. And so I think there's an opportunity to grow their earnings while reducing their debt. And that's how we get there. It's, it's pretty easy to see how they can do it. Now it just comes down to execution. But Zaslav has already done this. He'd done it with uh, scripts when they were five times leveraged. And he got it down in 14 months to leverage. Now's the point where this is a much bigger scale than the acquisition of scripts. But he, he works well under pressure. And I think that you're going to start to see the stock turn around. But it just takes time. Hasbro quite beaten down. Yeah, so Hasbro, uh, Hasbro's got his book kicked. Hasbro, it's not like, uh, what's his name? Cox, the CEO. To be honest, he comes across like a little bit of a, a douche, but what's his name? Um, something Cox. It's Cox. So this guy became CEO. He used to be the chief of Dungeon and Dragons, and then he became CEO. And he put two people in charge of Dungeon and Dragons and another one of their franchises. But these guys were like ex-Amazon, ex-Microsoft with absolutely no experience in content. Who cares if they're executive? This is not their, it's like me saying, hey, listen, I can analyze a company. Now let me go over there and do heart surgery. I don't know how to do it. I shouldn't be there. And he put two people that should not have been in charge of, for argument's sake, Dungeon and Dragons, in charge. And what did they start doing? They started taking big tech woke garbage and implementing it over to the community of, like, for argument's sake, Dungeon and Dragon. There was like notices coming up. This, this game was built before our executive team took over. This does not fairly reflect our views. Like, who cares? Like, all of this, like, we, we got a little bit too far. The communities got alienated, and there was just a lot of stuff that's been going on where, they're kind of destroying their by their, their own destruction. It's kind of like has kind of like Haynes Brands. They've kind of destroyed sort of like the fabric of their culture, essentially, with Chris Cox coming in as CEO. Um, obviously, he was under a lot of pressure. Alta Fox come in. Alta Fox put them under pressure as an activist investor. They ultimately failed. But Chris Cox recently sent the COO out the door, cut 15% of staff. It was a bloated staff count. So the earnings are going to increase, but here's the thing. The reason why it's selling off pretty hard is probably in part got to do with a risk-off type environment, but also Lego reported and they had fantastic earnings. The reason why I like Hasbro so much is not that it's well run. It's that the assets are incredibly valuable. Um, let's go back to uh, like Haynes Brands as, as an example. When you're looking at Haynes Brands... It's really interesting that every company I look at, uh, every company I look at has like a licensing agreement with Hasbro. So if we have a look back in 2021, Haynes Brands, Hasbro Gaming, Champion and Hasbro Gaming come together. So back in 21, they signed an agreement to do a a licensing agreement with uh, Hasbro. Uh, If we pop on over, we look back in 2019, Evolution Gaming, Asbro, Evolution Gaming are licensing Monopoly brands. So all of the franchises in Hasbro, in my view, are deeply undervalued. And the content is the value and the distribution is the innovation. Content never changes. The distribution is the revenue stream. 
So like, it's not Netflix that's highly valuable. It's the content that Netflix is renting is highly valuable because that's a new revenue stream for the content owner. So you go back a hundred years ago when Monopoly was built, nobody thought Monopoly was going to end up being a gambling game where you can play live Monopoly with Monopoly money. Nobody thought like, look at SciPlay. Um, SciPlay also have a, a, a slot machine and they're licensing, here it is here, they're licensing content from Hasbro for like different slot machines using Hasbro's, like these are kids games that are also being licensed in adult sort of markets. So what I'm trying to say is when I'm looking at Hasbro, the assets are really valuable, but the management are garbage. And eventually the market's already started to recognize that. You look at Alta Fox coming in last summer, trying to challenge the board. Company come out with horrible earnings. COO gets kicked out the door. CEO, CEO is on notice. And 15% of the staff get fired because it was a bloated staff. We have to see change. And I think it's going to start pretty soon. So with Hasbro, I really like the company because I think the assets are deeply undervalued. And again, like I can buy the assets undervalued. Wait a little bit of time. I think, you know, Chris Cox's time as CEO is probably coming to an end. Hell, if we had a couple of hundred million in the fund, maybe I might be an activist investor and join Alta Fox. And then combined, we could probably overrule the board and kick the CEO out. And then the price would start resetting because you'd start making the proper decisions. But unfortunately, we don't have that. We don't have that. Um, we don't have that uh, type of influence. But anyway, I think the assets are undervalued. It'll eventually reprice whether Cox comes to a census, does the right thing, or he gets booted out the door and somebody comes in and does the right thing. But I think the, the assets itself are, are very valuable. Um, licensing agreements is non-discretionary income. That's part of the reason why I bought it. For argument's sake, if we go into a recession and you've got a 10-year licensing agreement to provide online monopoly games with evolution, they have to pay it regardless of whether it's a recession or not. So it's non-discretionary. Um, so there is a segment of the revenue that's fairly durable. And then there's a segment of the revenue that's a little bit more, um, discretionary. So that, that's why I bought it. But, um, yeah. Why did they give up? They lost the proxy vote, unfortunately, but they, I, I think they only had about 4% of the outstanding shares. So you really got to have like, 10, if you really want to be an activist investor, you really got to have about 10% of the outstanding shares. What they don't, I think they only had about 4%. Um, like how big is this company? I think they had like 270. Yeah, I think they only had 270 million or 370 million invested. It was only like four or 5% of the company. So they were trying to leverage up uh, retail investors. And they just they just came up a little bit short, board one out. But as of right now, with the share price rolling over, if they came back, the management wouldn't have a chance. They would be booted out the door. Like if uh, Connor Haley came back, I think that these guys are will be out the door. Um, does the peso getting obliterated, good or bad for the USA? Well, uh, Ronnie, I guess you're in relation to the comments that I made earlier. Um, it, it, it's, it, it really depends. Um, I guess I had a chart structure here. What did I have? I was expecting it to be five, four, and then a lower low. Uh, look, I, I guess it really depends. Um, if I'm manufacturing goods and services as a U.S. company and I'm paying my production staff in Mexico and Mexican peso and it gets weaker and weaker and weaker, my margins are going to expand because of the positive foreign exchange tailwinds. Um, and the inverse is also true. So, you know, from a, from a foreign exchange perspective, yeah, I mean, there's definitely ways in which it could be a tailwind, but it's it's different for every company, right? Um, the cheaper the peso gets, the more attractive manufacturing becomes in Mexico as well. What's also interesting though, is since 2020, we've seen a big increase in the Mexican peso and we've seen Mexican assets actually increase. So despite all of that, and here's the thing, as US continue to deteriorate relationships with China, and I think they're beyond repairable, uh, Mexico is going to be a pretty important alliance. And there's all sorts of wonky stuff going on, like um, like the Mexican cartels are manufacturing the opioids that are coming across the border into the U.S. They're getting the raw materials from China. 
in China, if you're in a specific province, you can't cross over the, like, you can't cross the border inside China. You need permission. Like, you get a card for argument's sake, and you're only allowed to go to specific provinces at specific times. So if there's that level of control over the population in an autocratic world, that's why I'd never want to live there. I think China's system is horrible. There's no chance I'd want to live there. But if, if that's the level of control you have, it's very hard for me to believe that the people above do not realize that they're pretty much selling raw materials for opioids. And the main supplier, the Mexican cartels, are pretty much killing through ODs, 100,000 US citizens every single year. And that's what's happening. It's become highly politicized. The first person that's really spoke about it, like there's a lot of people that talk about it. There's experts that talk about it for argument's sake um, uh, that are experts on Mexican cartels. Vivek Ramaswamy is also talking about it. It's starting to come to the forefront right now. What I'm trying to say is the relationship between Mexico and China, Mexico, US, it kind of has to be moved closer to the US. And then it doesn't matter what the currency is. I think the US benefits regardless. Why? younger working age population, lower cost of production because the salaries in Mexico are lower than the US. So it really comes to, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of red tape that needs to be solved for, I think. But um, I think it'll be an individual case. There was a couple of questions, guys. Uh, let me just have a quick look. Uh, obviously we spoke about the valuation of Lumentum. Uh, Obviously, I like it. We spoke about Haynes Brands just a moment ago. I really appreciate your video update and the level of analysis you go into. I've heard your thesis on Haynes Brands, previous updates. Keen to hear if your view remains the same. Yeah, look, I, I just think the assets are very cheap. And I, I just think a ham sandwich could run the business. Um, either Cox gets his act together or he gets booted out of the company. And then it starts to re-rate. And at these valuations, look, I've got time. I, you know, I, I don't need that money for a couple of years. I've got time for it to re-rate. And I think they're worth double what I paid for it. So I can wait a couple of years. And um, if it gets to bizarre valuations, I can also add more. So my, my view hasn't really changed. Uh, another comment here, which looks kind of interesting. Hi, Rob, my question for your live stream. You have a spreadsheet and discount cash flow calculations for a lot of companies. If I saw correctly, you use the same discount cash flow approach for each company. How do I account for differences between firms? For example, so let me see what time this is at. Uh, this is at two hours and 11. So I'm just going to put this in notes. Two hours, 11 minutes. So as I can comment below for that gentleman. Um, how do I account for the differences between firms? For example, a high growth company versus a stable company uh, that is paying dividends versus a very cyclical company. Uh, it could also be an interesting video for a YouTube channel. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's a pretty good question. So let's Let's talk about that. Uh, in order to talk about that, let's pop on over here. So when we're looking at this kind of cash flow model, the framework is the same, but the assumptions are all different. So we're going to factor in cash flow growth here, right? So if the growth is really high, it's going to grow at a really fast pace. We're going to capture the earnings forecast into 2026, 2027, 2022, or excuse me, 2024, depending on how long our discount of cash flow model is analyzing present value of cash flows. But in this case, we're, we'll be factoring in the growth, its tax rate, appreciation, amortization, whatever, changes in working capital, which will reflect the differences between receivables, payables, inventories, current assets, current liabilities. Very important to look at that as well. So we're capturing the growth here. And as well as that, we're capturing the multiple that the market historically would pay for it. So we're taking a 10 or 15 year multiple enterprise value to EBITDA of the individual company. And that's different for every single business. So 11 times earnings might be the average multiple the market was willing to pay for Warner Bros. Discovery for the past 15 years might have a different business here. It might be in a different industry, it might be different margins, might be different growth, which again will be captured here. And it might be trading at 20 times, not 11 times. Another industry might have worse margins. It might be slow growth, it might be trading at six times and it's captured the multiple plus the growth here. Every business has a different capital structure. The capital structure breaks down like in its broadest form, debt, cash, and that's the same, and, and equity. It's the enterprise value. Now the debt can obviously break down even further. Like we mentioned earlier with Lumentum, there's like hybrid debt in there as well. There's like $1.6 billion in that debt pile. That's hybrid debt. It's convertible bonds, but it's, it's yielding something 
And there is actually a covenant that allows them to actually buy back that convertible bond before it converts so in 2026 and 2028. And so we're looking at the capital structure of the business. We're factoring in the interest expense on that. So in this case, you've got convertible bonds. So because it's a hybrid, it's got a lower interest expense. And it was done at the perfect moment, right? We talk about Haynes Brands not doing it at the perfect moment. Well, Lamentum done it at the perfect moment. Right conversion prices, right interest expense. And so their average interest expense is 3.09. So we're taking in the capital structure, the growth, the multiple, and then we're factoring in the cost of equity. So if it's high growth, it'll have a higher beta. And we'll factor in that the cost of equity needs to be a little bit higher. And once we plug those in, then we look for a terminal value using the perpetual growth rate, which is really looking at its cash flows and ultimately assuming that it'll grow in perpetuity at 1% in this case. And then we're also looking at enterprise value dividend. And we're taking both of these terminal values and we're taking the average. And then that average ultimately is what's given us an idea of what our equity value is. So although the structure of the discount cash flow model looks the same, the breakdown of it's always different. It's got it's, it's factoring in the volatility of the stock itself, the interest expense, the capital structure, the growth rates, the multiples, all that sort of stuff is factored in. So although it looks the same, every single one of these is completely different. It's completely different. And here's the thing, like this is a tool. Um, technical analysis, it's a tool. It shouldn't be, in my view anyway, it shouldn't be used on its own. This kind of cash flow model shouldn't be used on its own. There has to be deeper analysis. Um, but these are tools and they're only as good as your assumptions. So if I'm looking at technical analysis and I assume this is a support zone, it's really only going to perform based on the quality of that sort of assumption that that's a support zone if I buy it off. It's, it, this kind of cash flow model is really going to be effective based on the assumptions that I make here. And I'm trying to be as fair as possible using the average that the market was paying for 15 years using a 1% perpetual growth rate, assuming GDP growth is going to grow 1%. Looking at analyst estimates, and in most cases, like there's like 8, 10, 12, 15 analyst estimates, much better job than I'd ever do because it's given the consensus. Some of the estimates might be garbage. Some of them might be really good, but the average is usually fairly on the money. Well, fairly, not actually always, but some cases. And so that <clears throat> that's essentially what we're doing. And then we're, we're, we're even trying to be as fair as possible. We're looking at a terminal value using a perpetual growth rate model to understand what its enterprise value could be, but also using enterprise value to EBITDA, just a regular multiple, and then taking the average. So if you look at like this one here, it just so happens to be that Lumentum, both methods of calculating terminal value comes out pretty close to being the same. But if you look at something like Amazon, it's very different. So Amazon spits out completely different readings. Um, and this can work in both ways, depending on the capital structure. Perpetual growth rate is coming at 9 uh, 917 million, million. And enterprise value D, that's coming in at 4.6, excuse me, that's 917 billion or 4.6 trillion. So 917 billion, I think is somewhere close to where we currently are. We're currently at 972. So worst case scenario would be it's, it's even, but this is a kind of unique business because there's a massive capital expenditure cycle. Most of it's gone into AWS with higher margins, higher growth. Services greater than 50% of the business. So the multiple is going to be higher. And that's ultimately what you're seeing here. So each of them are different. Um, each of these are each of these are different. They all look the same, but they're, they're all very different. Um, they're all very, 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 very different. Okay. Uh, I think... Just trying to see, do we have any more comments? No, there's just a three. And if anyone else has any comments, fire away. If not, I won't take any more of your time. Raz, as always, a pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, we'll do them every couple of weeks. Keep in touch. And um, yeah, we'll write it through. I think we're at a critical point as of right now, to be honest. I think we're at a very critical point, And this is really what the main focus should be. Interest rates, impact on credit for argument's sake, and how quick the authorities can clean up this mess. But I'm, I'm feeling pretty good that they're just gonna throw money at it. What's the problem? Yeah, no problem. Here's, a, here's some money. Let's try and figure it out. Okay, guys, have a wonderful day. We'll catch up pretty soon. And with all the panic out there, I just think it's better to go fishing. Um, 
I'm not, I'm not, I'm not very concerned over a bigger time horizon. I think we're fine. Anyway, guys, have a wonderful day and I'll catch up with you guys soon. All the very best.